Services Committee. My name is Senator Ben Hansen. I represent the 16th Legislative District in Washington, Burke, Cumming, and parts of Stanton counties, and I serve as chair of the Health and Human Services Committee. I would like to invite the members of our committee to introduce themselves, starting on my left with Senator Ballard. Bo Ballard, District 21, Northwest Lincoln, and Northern Lancaster County. Good afternoon, Jen Day, Legislative District 49 in Sarpy County. Good afternoon. My name is Lynn Walls, and I represent Legislative District 15, which is Dodge County and Valley. Oh, sorry, Senator Michaela Cavanaugh, Legislative District 6, West Central Omaha, Douglas County. Merv Repeat, Legislative District 12, which is Southwest Omaha, and the good folks of Ralston. All right. Also assisting the committee is our legal counsel, legal, legal counsel Benson Wallace, our committee clerk Christina Campbell, and our committee pages for the for the day are, I lost them already. There we go, Peyton and Ethan. So a few notes about our policy and procedures for the day. First of all, it's gonna be kind of loud. So don't, it's all right. They do their best to kind of quiet everybody outside, but when they open the doors and close them, we hear a little bit of noise, but we do our best to make sure that uh, it's as quiet as we can so we can make sure we hear everybody who's testifying. If you do have any cell phones, make sure you please silence them or turn them off. And we will be hearing one bill today and it's listed in the order outside of the room. Uh, on each of the tables near the doors to the hearing room, you will find green testifier sheets. If you're planning to testify today, please fill one out and hand it to Christina or one of the pages when you come to testify. This will help us keep an accurate record of the hearing. If you are not testifying at the microphone but want to go on record as having a position on a bill being heard today, there are white sign-in sheets at each entrance where you may leave your name and other pertinent information. Also, I would note, if you are not testifying but have an online position to submit, the legislature's policy is that all comments for the record must be received by the committee. System to testify today, and that's a little box right in front there. Each testifier will have five minutes to testify. Actually, today we're gonna to narrow it down to three minutes. So the, the goal for today is to hear as many people as we can in the allotted time that we have. So we will be allowing three minute testimony for two hours and then two minute testimony for the remaining hour. The opposition will get one hour to testify in total and the supporters will get one hour and the opposition will also get one hour. So we afford the luxury to both the opponents and the supporters of the bill. And at the end, Oh, three hours, excuse me. Jeez, oh, I was like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I get you excited there. And then we also have neutral, neutral, neutral testimony at the end, but we are reserving that only for state agencies who come in, in a neutral position. So when you come up to testify, the light will be green. Uh, when the light turns yellow, that means you have one minute left to testify. And when the light turns red, we will ask you to end your testimony and wrap up your final thoughts as soon as you can. You might get a helpful reminder from me when the light turns red, just to make sure we kind of move things along as well. When you come up to testify, please begin by stating your name clearly into the microphone, and then please spell both your first and last name. The hearing with this bill will begin with the introducer's opening statement. After the opening statement, we will hear from supporters of the bill for a total of three hours, then from those in opposition for a total of three hours, and then followed by those speaking in neutral capacity. The introducer of the bill will then be given the opportunity to make a closing statement if they wish to do so. On a side note, the reading of testimony that is not your own is not allowed unless it's been pre-approved. 
And finally, we do have a strict no prop policy in the hearing today. So if you happen to have pictures or you want to bring up a prop or a sign or something else, please keep it to yourself. Um, that way we're fair to everybody else. So with that, oh yes, and on another side note, we're going to do our best to make sure that we kind of keep it as quiet as we can. So please, even though some people might be asking questions, the hearing is a lot to hear from people and not from the crowd. So please, no clapping, no noise. Uh, you will get one warning if we do. And then after that, I will have to ask the page to get you to leave. So when, you, when we enter people, we'll enter them from one door. And then when you exit, when you're done with your testimony, we'll have you exit out of that door right, um, on that side over there if you can, please. We'll also be kind of rotating each side. So we'll take testifiers from this side of the room first, and then we'll take testifiers from this side of the room first after we get through the invited testimony. So both sides will have invited testimony, a different number of people. We're going to go through the invited testimony first, and this is who the introducer um, preferred to have testify first that might have pertinent information. And then we'll go to uh, everybody else for, for testimony on their end. So I think I covered everything. So with that, we will start uh, with today's hearing, and it is LB 574, and we will welcome up S Senator Kalth to open. Thank you, Chair Hanson. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chairman Hanson and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Kathleen Kauth, spelled K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N-K-A-U-T-H, and I represent District 31 in Millard and South Omaha. LB 574, <clears throat> the Let Them Grow Bill, is designed to protect kids with gender dysphoria from irreversible, destructive, experimental medical procedures until they have reached adulthood. LB 574 prohibits performing medical procedures or prescribing medications that alter the appearance of a child's gender. This includes cross-sex hormones, puberty blockers, and a wider variety of gender-altering surgeries. I do not take the implications of this bill lightly, and I recognize the emotions that exist among all the stakeholders and in this room today. As legislatures, the future and safety of our children are top priorities. It is in the interest of the state of Nebraska to protect the most vulnerable of its citizens. I believe in and support parental rights, and I support the balance therein. We have laws that protect kids from abuse, exploitation, and from exposure to dangerous substances like alcohol and drugs. As adults, we understand that a child's brain is not fully formed and cannot comprehend the ramifications of making irreversible medical decisions. We see this in the way that we treat children differently than adults when they interact with the criminal justice system. The intent behind Let Them Grow is to give children the time they need to work through the gender dysphoria and any other complicating issues they may be experiencing before they engage in radical, irreversible, and damaging interventions to alter their appearance. The facts are that these novel and irreversible procedures lack sufficient long-term research. Yet our country and our state are witnessing a push to encourage youth with gender dysphoria into these interventions. To this end, LB 574, Let Them Grow, prohibits puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and gender-altering surgeries until the age of majority in Nebraska, which is 19. One of the most disturbing aspects of the current trend with gender dysphoric youth is the risk of suicide. Parents and children are being told that a young person experiencing gender dysphoria is more likely to commit suicide. The studies that are cited are rife with flaws and weaknesses in study design. New analysis shows rather than solving the problem, medical interventions make the risk of suicide worse once all the surgeries are completed. A 30-year study out of Sweden documents how individuals who have complete gender-altering surgery are 19 times more likely to kill themselves. Once the intensity of the treatments and the surgeries are complete, these individuals are still dealing with issues that the surgeries have only made more complex. In recent years, countries that have been on the forefront of progressive LGBTQ plus policies like Sweden, Finland, and the UK have reversed their stance on gender altering drugs and procedures for minors. Sweden now prohibits these irreversible medications and surgical procedures under the age of 18. Finland advises that under 25 not engage in them and prohibits under 18. 
and the UK is in the process of shutting down its largest gender clinic, the Tavistock Institute. And it is now ruled that children under age 16 cannot consent to puberty blockers. We owe it to our children to pay attention to what these countries, who are decades ahead of us on this journey, are doing and why. You will shortly hear from doctors detailing the drugs and the surgeries. They will talk about how damaging it is to the body to halt puberty. Puberty blockers can cause disruption in bone and brain development, increased body fat, possibly arterial hypertension, and infertility. Cross-sex hormones can cause blood clots, high triglycerides, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and to stabilize certain psychiatric disorders. And those are in children. You will hear about how some of the coexisting factors, such as depression, anorexia, and autism, that make kids vulnerable to this ideological movement and the proliferation of online pro-transition sites and groups. You will hear that the vast majority, more than 85% of kids with gender dysphoria will desist if left alone in a process called watchful waiting. These children need therapy to deal with the coexisting mental and emotional struggles they are experiencing, not irreversible, harmful experimental medical procedures. Gender services have become a very lucrative field of practice. Vanderbilt University Medical Center's Clinic for Transgender Health physician, Dr. Shane Taylor, describes how she persuaded the hospital to, quote, get into the gender transition game, unquote. In a video, the doctor emphasizes that gender transition is a big moneymaker. The cost of off-label use of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones for minors is nearly 10 times the amount as it is for adults. The American Academy of Pediatrics has been criticized by other organizations, such as the Academy for Eating Disorders, for their recent stance on improving medications and surgeries inappropriately for children regarding their recent approach to childhood obesity. Their independence from a financial reliance of pharmaceutical companies has been questioned. Clearly, there are financial motivations for pushing these treatments for gender transphoria on vulnerable youth and their desperate families. Finally, you will hear from some incredibly brave individuals today, and I implore you to give them your full attention. These are people who have experienced firsthand the pain of gender dysphoria, the pressure to relieve that pain through irreversible medical transitions, and the devastating after effects. I am in awe of the courage these individuals show. They are targeted and attacked by those who do not support their decisions to detransition or to speak out against the process and against these experimental procedures. Thank you for allowing the Let Them Grow bill to be heard today. I am open for questions. I mean, thank you for your opening. Are there questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Day. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Thank you, Senator Kaut, yes. for being here today. You mentioned a, stu a study in Sweden mm -hmm. talking about 19 times. Do you perhaps have the information on where that comes from? I will get it to you at okay. uh, the Karolinska Institute, and we have the studies. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Yes, Senator Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, um, Senator Calvin. Sorry. Um, first, I just want to start out by, and I'm going to make this announcement periodically, just for anybody that's watching that needs it, that you can text START to 678-678 in case you are needing um, support today Wonderful. during this hearing. And also you can call 1-800-866-488-7386, uh, again, if you need help. So repeat that. Because so, oh, yes. Here. Thank you. 866 Four eight eight seven three eight six. For anybody that is watching at home or in this room, if you need any help today, please be sure and reach out and don't don't do this alone. Um, so thank you for letting me get that in. Um, I want a couple of questions about how this bill kind of came to you. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes we work with advocacy groups or individuals. Did you work with anyone on bringing this bill? This bill came about because in the summer, uh, the Biden administration decided that it was going to withhold um, free and reduced lunch money from schools that did not have a gender inclusive policy allowing boys sure. to play on girls teams and boys and girls to share locker rooms. And that's how it started. Um, but in, in the drafting of the bill and bringing it forward? Absolutely. I, I call on different states. I called on Nebraska Family Alliance. I called on the Catholic Conference. I called on every group I could think of that had experience with this. Um, I worked with a senator in Arkansas, uh, Omaha, or, pardon me, not Omaha, Ohio. Uh, I talked with people in South Carolina. It, it's been a long process. And a follow-up to that. Um, 
sorry, I, I made notes on the bill, so <laughs> I'm referencing them. I, I'm more technology than paper, but um, so did you work with any healthcare entities locally? See all the doctors behind me? Yes. I don't, but I said okay, that they a are. a lot of doctors <laughs> behind me, yes. And okay. we, we brought in a lot of doctors to talk about this. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in the drafting of the bill, because I have some questions about some of the language in the bill. And so I'm just wondering if the medical community was involved in drafting of the language. They, they reviewed it. Yes. Okay. Um, I have other questions. Are you planning on closing? Cause some of them might be answered during. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a close. I think that I maybe will save those and see okay. if they're answered during the course Thank of this. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, we'll see you at the close, which I'm sure will be shortly. So just for reference, so we'd be the same for both sides. The three hours will start when we have the first testifier. So with that, we will in, we will bring we will invite the first invited testimony in support of LB574. Good Welcome. afternoon. My name is uh, Scott Nugent, S-C-O-T-T-N-E-W-G-E-N-T. -E my name is Scott Nugent. I'm a lesbian and I'm a trans man. But my most important role is that of a parent to three incredible children. I'm a mother and a woman who has given birth and carried life. I'm here today to put an end to the idea that medical transitioning children is about human rights. It is not. It's about money. Market research predicts that gender affirming care will generate more than $5 billion by the end of the decade. The truth is, is that medical transition is experimental, it's dangerous, and it doesn't cure anything. But convincing you it does unlocks insurance companies and governments to pay for it. We now have children's hospitals all over Europe that are halting the medicalization of children. The leading country in Sweden has shut down all medical transitioning. All of Europe is doing the same thing. They're calling it the biggest medical scandal in modern history. Yet here in the United States, we think it's about human rights. It is not. I underwent more than $1 million worth of surgeries and hormone therapies to change from Kelly, a woman, to Scott, a trans man. And I almost died in the process. In fact, I still have Infections, as you can see right now, I'm suffering from one. These infections will shorten my life because these procedures are experimental. I tried to kill off the female side because I was sold a lie. I was told that I was a man trapped in a woman's body, that my masculine traits and my strong personality were proof that I was really a man. I was told if I pump myself with testosterone, all my self-loathing would magically disappear. Remove my breasts, alter my genitalia, but I was tricked. You cannot transition your pain away. You only add to it. If only I had embraced my differences, if only the medical community would have accepted me for who I was, my wife for who I was. We need to let these children have time to learn to love their natural bodies and embrace their differences. With gender interventions, there are no Pause buttons. 10,000 complaints against Lupron, against uh, precocious puberty. Testosterone is irreversible. Males on estrogen can be permanently sterilized in four months. Are you really going to listen to or take stock in the AAP that follows WPATH, an entity that accepts eunuchs as a gender for children, an entity that has never held up in a court of law anywhere in the world as a baseline for care, medical transition is experimental, all of it, except for top surgery. And that's the truth. Okay, I see that your red light is on. Thank you for your testimony. I'm just gonna say one more thing and then I'll leave. Briefly, it's fine. The, fine. For you to do and do the right thing today, you will be considered a bigot. 
but tomorrow you will be a hero. This is wrong on every level. I've done it. I've researched it. I've talked to hundreds of transgender people. Don't do this to kids. Hey, Scott. Hey, Scott. Hey, Scott. <laughs> Okay, like I mentioned before, please no applause. If I have to, and I really don't wanna to have to, if we hear too much noise, the clerks will come and remove you. So, Scott, sorry. It's okay. Um, we're gonna see if there's any uh, questions from the, sure. the committee, if that's okay. Is there any questions? Yes, Senator Morris. Thank you, Chairman Hanson. Um, can you just talk a little bit about your life prior to the surgery? Like, just tell me a little bit about yourself prior to. Why I, why I decided to, yeah. it's a good question. It's a really good question. And here's the truth. Um, I was 42 years old. I was a successful you know, business sales executive, uh, but I was married to a woman that didn't really embrace being a lesbian. And um, so it came at a time where, you know, we had been together for a while. And over the years, I always heard that, you know, you do this like a man, you do that like a man. It just kind of went in my ear and, and out the other ear. And then when the social contagion started coming and the Jazz Jennings and the this and the that and, um, you know, <laughs> some, some different family issues, you know, I just kind of said, hey, you know what, maybe, maybe I was born on the wrong body. And that was just something that was just grabbed onto. And then after that, you know, being vulnerable, I... I went to a therapist, a, a transgender woman therapist, because I thought that would be the best thing to do. And within five minutes, she looked at me and said, how long have you been wearing male clothing? I was a business sales executive. I looked like Jillian Anderson. Nobody would think that I was a man. But that sentence at 42 absolutely changed my life. I won't get to meet my grandkids. Th this will kill me. These infections will kill me. This is serious. It's not about human rights, but that one sentence changed the whole trajectory of my life. And then I went to a uh, gynecologist who said to me, oh, wow, you've got a nice little jaw there. Have you ever been tested for intersex? The issue is that insurance wasn't paying for it at that time, but I could write a $70,000 check. So at 42, if I'm not able to navigate through this, you think that children with an immature frontal lobe can? You're nuts. All of you are nuts if you think you can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee? All right. Seeing none, thank you for coming. Appreciate it. All right. We'll take our next invited testifier. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Mario Presents, M A R I O P R E S C N T S and I am the Director of Chapters for Gays Against Groomers. We are a coalition of gay, bisexual, and trans people dedicated to the protection of children from LGBTQ ideology in media, education, and medicine. We support Legislative Bill 574 because it provides children the opportunity to grow up naturally and not subject them to untested, controversial, and sometimes disastrous procedures. Children aged 8 to 14 are undergoing rapid changes in the body. An immature amygdala coupled with elevated developmental hormones prevents the ability of foresight in teens, and our society takes great measures to assure that these impressionable minds are protected. Beer commercials can't show consumption. Movies have a rating system. And no one under the age of 18 is allowed into an NC-17 movie, even with a parent. Radical gender ideology is trying to convince rational, sane people that a child can choose their gender at the onset of puberty. Your bill offers protections for those with an identifiable medical condition, which everyone can agree with. I also have a medical condition in my family that presents itself in classic Punnett Square fashion. My father worked hard to make sure that my our condition didn't leave us permanently disfigured, and three out of his four boys had the necessary medical procedures. It was never expected or assumed that the state would finance, support, or take care of our medical needs. This is the assumed responsibility of a father and a family who want to see their children grow up into healthy, mature adults. Family support is the most important part of mental health, according to psychologists, the world over. 
Perhaps this is why Thailand made parental consent a cornerstone of their gender-affirming legislation in 2013. Even for those we consider adults, without parental consent, those aged 20 and younger are prohibited from receiving gender-affirming care. Anyone under the age of 18 is barred from these procedures completely, and adults who truly need this care are followed closely by endocrinologists and therapists throughout their long-term care to avoid rejection of this new identity, which is also included in their law. Never before in history have so many young people been rushed to hormone blockers, chest binders, and double mastectomies as they are now. Children are not an experiment, nor will we allow them to become lifelong pharmaceutical dependents. Join history and protect the children of the future by letting them grow up into healthy adults the way that they're meant to be. Just let them grow. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Well, I have you on for one second. We'll see. Are there any questions from the committee? All right. Seeing none. Thank you very much. All right. We'll take our next testifier, invited testifier. Welcome. My name is Luca Hein, L U K A H E I N. I was born in Nebraska and I've lived here all my life. And I'm here today not only as someone who has been through the gender affirming care system as a minor, but as someone who is a victim of it and is, has been greatly harmed by it. I was a young teenager with a history of mental health issues who was groomed and preyed upon online, and as a result, spiraled into a hatred of both towards myself and my body. The medical system did not look into or seem concerned about any underlying causes that led me to distress and made me feel the need to escape my body at such a young age. Instead, I was affirmed down a path of medical intervention that I could not fully understand the long-term impacts and consequences of due to both my age and my mental health conditions. At 16, the very first medical intervention I ever had was a double mastectomy. And a few months later, I was put on cross-sex hormones, both through UM UNMC, through Dr. Amora. As a result of this so-called gender-affirming care, if you could even call it care, at 21, I deal with constant joint pain. My breasts are gone, and I do not know if I will ever be able to carry a child someday. I will deal with these consequences for possibly the rest of my life, never knowing if they'll go away and feeling abandoned by the medical professionals who did this to me. My parents were baited with the threat of me committing suicide, despite the fact that I maintained I was never suicidal. They were told, would you rather have a dead daughter or a living son? These are not the words of a medical professional, but the words of an activist. I was just a teenager who needed actual help, not surgery. I needed that chance to grow up safe and whole, but it was taken away from me in the name of gender affirming care. I will have to live with this forever. And so will the many others like me who are now stepping forward and sharing their experience with this system. Children cannot consent to being life-calling medical patient, patients. Puberty and growing up are not diseases that need to be fixed with surgery and medicine. Children deserve to know that their body isn't something that needs to be fixed. They deserve to grow up whole and they deserve to be given a chance at life as an adult before that is taken away from them by these medical practices. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there uh, questions from the committee at all? No. Thank you for coming. All right, we'll take our next invited testifier. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Erin Brewer, E-R-I-N-B-R-E-W-E-R. -E -E I'm a former trans kid. I started identifying as a boy in first grade after a brutal sexual assault. And I have no doubt that if I'd had the option to take puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, that I would have done everything I could have to obtain them, including threatening suicide. In the short term, it would have been so much easier for me to kill myself as a girl in an attempt to be a boy with puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and surgery than to work through the very difficult feelings of my trauma. Initially, I probably would have felt better Testosterone is a controlled substance, and almost anyone who takes it initially feels a sense of euphoria. 
It would have boosted my confidence and increased my energy. It would have allowed me to completely dissociate from myself as a girl and create a new persona to pretend that the horrible trauma that triggered my gender dysphoria didn't happen to me. But in the long term, it would have reinforced the mistaken belief that caused me to develop gender dysphoria, that it was too dangerous to be a girl. If I had been medically transitioned, I wouldn't have gotten the help that I so desperately needed to work through my fear and shame and self-hatred. I never would have realized that my transgender identity was a coping mechanism, and I have talked to dozens of detransitioners who were not so lucky, like those sharing their story here today. I am grateful to those who helped me to understand that my gender dysphoria was the result of a sexual assault, and not because I was inherently flawed or born in the wrong body. Puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones allow children to avoid facing their problems and avoid, and whether that be grappling with homophobia, struggling with autism, or trying to reset, recover from significant trauma. It is our job as adults to give children the message that no matter how intense and how difficult their feelings are, that they can work through them without disassociating from themselves to become a different person, without irreversibly damaging themselves in the process. We know that encouraging children to run away from their pain and struggles is not a good solution, even if it makes them feel better in the short term. It is natural for children to do do what they can to shut down difficult feelings, which is why we have policies to stop them from self-medicating with drugs and alcohol. We need similar policies to protect children from the dangerous effect of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. I urge this committee to provide the children of Nebraska who are struggling with gender dysphoria the same gift I got. Please vote for this important legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Reby. First of all, I'd like to thank you and the other people that have stepped forward with all the courage that you've given. I guess the question, and I don't, I don't want to delve too much and get too personal. I, that's not my intent. But in reading your document, it looks like you made the journey alone. Um, uh, you didn't mention that parents or other significant adults in here. I actually was very lucky. Um, as a child, when I went into first grade and insisted that I was a boy, um, my teacher noticed that I was also very aggressive in trying to act like a boy. I wanted to go into the boys' bathroom. And rather than affirming that I was a boy, which is what would likely happen today, she sent me to the school psychologist for assessment. And the school psychologist came up with a plan to help me to overcome the very difficult feelings I was having. So I had lots of support from loving and caring adults. And I'm very grateful to that. And I assume this happened outside of Nebraska. Mm. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Are there any other questions? I have one. Uh-huh. What's it like, and I maybe should have asked this from the first testifier because they can shed some light on this if they have a little extra time. What's it like sharing your testimony publicly like this to the trans community as a whole? It has been incredibly devastating. Um, I have lost friendships. I've lost very close family members. I've been threatened. Um, Somebody walked up to my son and said, I hope you know that the LGBTQ community wants to kill your mother. It's been incredibly difficult. And one of the reasons that there aren't more people behind me ready to testify is that they're worried about losing their jobs. They're worried about being bullied. They're worried about their kids being bullied. They're worried about their personal safety. Um, I've been spit on, I've been tripped, I've been called terrible names for speaking out and telling my story. It's incredibly difficult to come up here and talk about my childhood trauma. It's incredibly difficult to come up here and rehash all that. But these kids are worth it. We love them so much and we're willing to put ourselves, our lives, our jobs, our livelihoods on the line to protect them. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we will take our next invited testifier. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Kat Kattinson, C-A-T-C-A-T-T-I-N-S-O-N, and I'm a detransitioned woman. I experienced discomfort around my biological sex beginning in early childhood, but I didn't learn about transgenderism until age 13 in the mid-2000s when I accessed my first website for female to male transgender people. After I learned about gender dysphoria, I had an epiphany. The reason I had social difficulties, was bullied, and felt uncomfortable in my body was because I was meant to be born a boy. 
Back then, I didn't find any information on puberty blockers, which are now readily available for minor girls. I began starving myself and throwing up after meals to erase the feminine curves I was developing. As I lost weight, my health deteriorated and I was diagnosed with anorexia. Doctors were concerned as they could see I was underweight even when I insisted I felt fat. At no point did anyone affirm my anorexia by agreeing with me that if I felt fat, I must be correct. Why is it that later when I told providers I felt like a boy, my delusion was affirmed? Both eating disorders and gender affirming care, a euphemism for medical abuse, result in irreversible harm. I continued to struggle with eating disordered thoughts and gender dysphoria throughout my, teens, my teen years and early adulthood. I considered medical transition, but hesitated to take testosterone because I had been a singer my whole life and my voice was an integral part of my identity. By age 28, I was desperate. I believed that if I didn't transition, I would kill myself. I now know that the transition or suicide narrative is a pervasive manipulation tactic based on pseudoscience. I came out as transgender publicly and several months later, I called Planned Parenthood who prescribed me testosterone without ever meeting me in person. Not long after that, I talked to a different Planned Parenthood doctor who wrote me an approval letter for a double mastectomy. Initially, the testosterone made me euphoric, but it wasn't long before I suffered health complications such as heart palpitations, body pain, and urinary incontinence. I was so convinced that medical transition was my only option that I probably would have kept going if it weren't for a sudden voice change that robbed me of my ability to sing. My voice was and still is hoarse, raspy, and painful. I thought, what have I done to myself? Hoping to heal my voice as much as I could, I stopped testosterone. I realized that rushing into irreversible changes hadn't been the right course, and I also canceled my surgery and legal name change. Today, I accept that I am a woman, and that is an immutable biological fact. I'm extremely grateful I was not offered puberty blockers, hormones, or surgery as a minor. If I had been, I would likely suffer from infertility, osteoporosis, brain damage, or any number of unknown health issues as these interventions are experimental. No minor should be allowed to suffer permanent damage at the hands of doctors. I wholeheartedly support LB 574. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Kavanaugh. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And I'm very sorry for what you've been through. It's, I, as Senator Hansen mentioned, it's very hard to come and share stories like this in such a public forum. So thank you for doing that. Um, and I, I, I hope this does not diminish your experience at all, but I wanted to ask if this happened to you while in Nebraska, in Nebraska care, um, because we're specifically talking about what Nebraska care looks like, and that's not to diminish your experience at all. I just want a clarification on that point. Um, no, I am not from Nebraska, and this did, did not happen to me in, in Nebraska, but the, the measures that trans activists are, are pushing for is they want it everywhere. It's, it's ubiquitous. Um, and kids all across the country are hearing this ideology. I understand. And I, I pre again, I very much appreciate you sharing your experience. And I'm very sorry for you, what you've been through. Um, I just needed that clarification. But thank you for being here. Of course. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you for coming. Thank you. We'll take the next invited testimony. Welcome. Hi. Hi, um, hi, my name is Atoa Vayasu. That's A T O A V A I A S O. I'm here to share my testimony. I started taking hormones when I was 19. This is back in the 80s. When I was 19, I thought I was a woman trapped, being trapped in a man's body. So I started to pursue my journey into becoming a woman. I started taking estrogen and boosters. I started to have breasts. I started to look and feel like a woman. I lived as a woman 24 seven. But as time went by, I realized this is not the life that I wanna live. This is not what I want myself for myself. I wanted to get married and have children. I stopped taking the hormones I met a beautiful woman. I've been married now for 23 years, 23 wonderful years. I wish I had someone that, that could have told me about consequences in taking female hormones. 
I thank God that I never went as far as having the operation. But I'll never have a chance to say, she's got my nose, or he's got my eyes. Yes, I don't have children of my own, but I have, I have become a man because I didn't get the sex change operation. Let the children grow up to be adults and decide for themselves. When I started down this path of becoming what I thought I wanted to be, I did not have anybody to tell me the consequences I faced. Now that I have changed my mind, I thank God that I for bringing me through what I've been through. I'm a living example that you can change your mind and turn your life around. Don't do to the kids what I did to my body. Don't take away from the children a chance to change their mind. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you for coming. Thank you. We'll take our next invited testimony. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senators. Thanks for hearing us today. My name is Tiffany Frost, and I live in Bennington, T-I-F-F-A-N-I-F-R-O-S-T. -I, I come today in support of LB 574. Most people that are here today argue against this bill, saying that, sorry, insisting that if a transgender person doesn't receive gender-affirming care, they will commit suicide. I've heard it hundreds of times. I've actually heard it from my own child's mouth. I've heard it from a therapist. I will not argue that transgender and gender dysphoric people are in a great deal of distress because they are. However, let's get to the root of their distress rather than permanently medicalizing them. My child was in therapy for years before he came out as transgender. Long before he even knew what transgender meant, he suffered from de depression and anxiety. After I expressed my concerns about moving forward with permanent changes and refusing to affirm my son's identity. My son's therapist tried to explain to me that disagreeing with my child about his desire to transition, my child, <clears throat> my child equated that to me not loving him. You see, the therapist tried to convince me that my son's brain wasn't equipped to make decisions that will permanently alter his body. Many people that identify as transgender also suffer from a variety, of, a variety of mental health comorbidities. Instead of flooding children's bodies with puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and mutilating their bodies, let's focus on providing better mental health care. And I'm not talking about the affirmative model of mental health care. I'm talking about gender exploratory therapy instead as the appropriate model. According to the Gender Exploratory Therapy Association, gender affirming therapies fall short when it comes to a list of concerns, including the idea that our kids' gender identities are not fixed as adolescents. Identity exploration is a normal part of a child and young adult development. So why would we introduce a medical intervention without letting that development take place? So let's get to the root of the problem and help our kids explore why they feel the way that they do. Let's get to the root of the distress. Address their anxiety, depress, depression, ADHD, autism, and the other host of, host of comorbidities that many of them face when they are questioning their gender. Thank you for your time. Thank you for testifying. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Cavanaugh. Thank you. Thank you for being here um, and sharing your story. I know. As a parent, that's hard to go through. Um, if this were enacted, there would be parents that felt differently about what they were being told by the therapist was the right course of action for their child. And I guess I'm just on the other side of that. You were able to make the choice that you felt was right for your child. This would not allow afforded another parent to do the same thing. Do you? Well, I, you don't have to, but would you want to speak to that or how you, do you see it differently than I'm seeing it? I guess I'm just looking for some more insights. My idea is that we are here to protect our children and performing ex experimental 
starts on our kids is not beneficial, whether it's my child or someone else's child. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for being here. Seeing no other questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll take our next invited testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, dear Chairperson Hansen and members of the Nebraska State Legislature Health and Human Service Committee, my name is Greg Brown, G R E G B R O W N. I live in Kearney. I have a PhD in the biological basis of health and human performance. I'm a professor of exercise physiology. I'm here today to speak in favor of LB 574 on my own behalf. My statement does not represent any type of statement on behalf of my employer. From a biological point of view, human beings are either male or female. While there are disorders of sexual development that may be called intersex, which can be identified through laboratory tests, these disorders affect less than 0.02% of all humans. And a person with an intersex condition is still biologically either male or female. Don't let anyone to try, you, try to tell you otherwise. Humans are either male or female based on their biology. Gender dysphoria is not the same as intersex, but you're going to hear people who try to conflate the two. Instead, gender dysphoria is when a person has a gender identity that does not align with their biological sex, but there is no biology-based test for gendered identity. You can't get an X-ray, an MRI, a CT scan, or a blood DNA or genetic test to identify gender dysphoria. Puberty blockers are a class of drugs called gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonists. They cause the pituitary gland to stop producing follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which then interferes with normal puberty when administered to children. Puberty blockers are not FDA-approved for treating gender dysphoria. I just can't fathom stopping the normal and healthy process of puberty in a child and then calling it health care. There are very few studies of puberty blockers on growth and development in children. But what those few studies show is that administering puberty blockers to gender dysphoric children does not simply pause puberty while gender dysphoria is resolved. Instead, over 90% of the children who are prescribed puberty blockers continue on to a lifetime of pharmaceutical treatments and surgery. However, the current research shows that even after eight years of puberty blockers and then cross-sex hormones, biologically male individuals still have more lean body mass and body height than biological females. In other words, using puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones does not cause a person to change their biological sex. Um, and as you've hear, heard, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones do not alleviate depression, anxiety, or other common psychological comorbidities associated with gender dysphoria. Nebraska has laws to protect children from the effects of using alcohol, tobacco, and other harmful substances. I encourage you to pass LB 574 to protect Nebraska's children from the harmful effects of puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and unnecessary surgeries. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? You, you must have done that good of a job. <laughs> no questions. All right. All right. Thank you Thank very you. much. All right. We will take the next invited testimony. Maybe wait one second here. Give me a chance to nestle into this chair. <laughs> You can get started whenever you'd like. Okay. Good afternoon, Senator Hansen and members of the HHS committee. My name is Dr. Jennifer Bowens. That's B-A-U-W-E-N-S. I'm a licensed therapist and a clinical researcher. I currently serve as the, uh, the director of the Center for Family Studies at Family Research Council. On the basis of over 25 years of experience as a clinician providing uh, trauma therapy to children and as a researcher investigating the psychological effects of traumatic stress, I offer my support for Bill 574 Let Them Grow Act. Historically, children have been treated as a special and a vulnerable class in both the psychological and research fields. Greater caution has been applied to children in light of the fact that they do not have the neurological capacity to understand lifelong decisions. Thus, we've always proceeded with uh, caution when regard to interventions for children, particularly when the evidence is weak or the research methods are in the early phases, which is the case in, the, in this body of literature. 
What is being referred to as gender affirming care is in direct opposition to our knowledge regarding development and our understanding of good research and treatment. Compared to other psychological disorders in the DSM-5 TR, gender dysphoria is currently being treated with the most invasive interventions connected to a psychological issue. Gender affirming care has also created a, mo a monopoly on treatment options as it demands that there is only one way, only one way to treat gender dysphoria. And by comparison, I would really urge you to look at the Cochrane Collaboration website, cochrane.org. Just type in any disorder you want, um, but you could type in depression and you'll see a whole host of treatments that you can use to treat depression for children. But when it comes to gender dysphoria, there's actually only one way. There's only one path, um, and that is to try to make a child to be someone else. There are a number of concerns that I have with both clinically and with the research, and just to name a few, one, these interventions are, are being endorsed based on consensus, not evidence. That means the practices were voted on rather than standing on the merits of solid research findings addressing gender dysphoria. Two, the success rate for non-intervention for gender dysphoria already exceeds what most psychological, uh, success rates for most psychological interventions. And three, the research around this practice does not account for um, competing diagnoses or variables. For example, 45% of trans identifying folks um, reported childhood sexual abuse, and that's from the Williams Institute, which is an LGBT think tank. And I can tell you as a trauma clinician, um, someone who has experienced uh, sexual trauma, it's not uncommon for them to hate parts of their body or wanna get rid of those aspects of themselves that made them vulnerable. And four, we often hear the claim um, that a failure to provide these interventions will increase the risk of suicide, but this approach is actually um, unethical and a clear departure from uh, the practice of empowerment and self-management, which are important goals of mental health practices. Uh, these kids deserve better, you have, and we should I'm be sorry, innovating. You have the red light if you oh, could, if I'm you so could sorry. just wrap up your thoughts. Yes, um, I would just say I, I would love to see uh, room for innovation around these practices that kids could have multiple ways for their gender dysphoria to be treated. Thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Bowens. Um, are there any questions from the committee? Okay, uh, Senator Walls. Thank you. Thanks for coming today. You know, as I listen to the past uh, testifiers, I'm just kind of wondering what what type of opportunities have they or do people have for counseling and what barriers are there for opportunities for counseling? Yeah. Um I love my profession. I love helping children in their most vulnerable time. But unfortunately, my profession has gone off the rails. And um, what, we're, what we have right now is so much pressure. I mean, it's, I, I feel the pressure coming out here, say, you know, coming against my field because we have an affirmation pathway. When, like I said, when you look at Cochrane Collaboration and you type in gender dysphoria, there's one meta-analysis on, on this whole topic. And yet the science is supposed to be settled. Um, so as a clinician, I, there is immense pressure to go down this path of affirmation. There are many other ways that we could treat it because we know 45% are experiencing abuse. Yeah, I'm, I'm more curious yeah. on what type of opportunities are available and what are the barriers for people to have that, that opportunity that. for yeah. counseling. Is so it if money, oh, is it, can you talk about Sure. Um, so I think it's primarily in at the get-go. You come in for an assessment, and if you say your issue is gender dysphoria, you're, guess what? You're going to be onboarded to that path. But if you start saying, you know, I've had this trauma in my life, then all of a sudden there are these other options and opportunities for other root issues to be assessed. But if, if gender dysphoria or something of distress about about your um, uh, incongruence with your biological sex and your perceived sex or perceived gender is then you're you're automatically put on a different pathway and and you're not going to find help okay. thank you i'll go next so <laughs> appreciate it i just do what i'm told here so hey <laughs> don't we all <laughs> no uh can you, we're receiving a lot of correspondence about the potential for suicide. We're receiving a lot of 
a lot of emails, correspondence about the potential for suicide. I think one of the test fires even said, I'll read verbatim, the, the, they're baited in threats of committing suicide. Can you unpack that for us through yeah. your... Yeah. So the first thing I'd like to say is um, when I first started my career, I, I was trained on a suicide hotline and we were never, ever taught to say to someone to plant the seed of if you don't get X, Y, Z, then you might commit suicide. Um, second, I worked in this domestic violence space and we would often hear the story that um just like, we would often hear this story that, you know, um, maybe the, the person abusing, if I, if you leave me, I will commit suicide. So that is manipulation. I would often tell the person I was working with, you know, you can't live your life based on that threat of suicide. Of course, we're going to assess, we care about this person, but I'm not going to live under and make all of my decisions based on that threat. Here's the problem when it comes to a family that's getting, bringing their child to treatment and they're told, um, if, if you don't do X, Y, Z, if you don't take your child down this affirmation path, then your child is likely to commit suicide. First of all, that is an intervention. We can clearly identify there is an independent and a dependent variable at work here. The independent variable is the, the actual act of saying you are going to commit suicide. That is motivating that parent to do what you want them to do and not giving them options. I, I'm trained in all kinds of things. Um, EMDR, trauma-focused CBT. When a client comes to me, I can say, these are your options. If this one doesn't fit for you, here are a number of different paths you can go. But gender dysphoria, if you don't affirm, then this child's going to commit suicide. That, that is a bad practice. It's unethical. And it could actually, I mean, if anyone here is a clinician, you could be reported to a board for planting that kind of seed into your client. And three, the empirical data doesn't support this claim. So here we have, we have some, this, this bold proclamation, which the suicide literature is a much longstanding body of work says that there are certain risk factors. We know if somebody has um, mental illness, uh, if they have a trauma history, if they have substance abuse, those types of things, those are clear risk factors that someone might predict some, that someone might commit suicide. But the suicide literature even notes that there isn't a clear package that's going to say this person will in fact commit suicide. And here it is with, with this type of care, we have these large predictions that are just absolutely unfounded by, by the, the data. Thank you. Sorry for that long answer. No. But <laughs> Senator Rico. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Thank you for being here. How do we help parents as they have concerns and all parents are concerned about their children and how that's going to unfold? Do we make sure that we get them to some individual who's maybe in a neutral position so that if you go to the wrong therapist from the get-go, you're likely to be pushed in a certain direction. So that first decision is critically important. So we need to, I don't know how we sort through that other than through ethics, but how do we get help parents out to find out the therapist in their community that can be objective and help them work through this? Well, that's a really tough question. And, and <laughs> because uh, right now, the, the fact is that if you bring a, a child to a therapist and you mention gender dysphoria, then the pathway is clear. So you, you don't talk about gender dysphoria. And that's, that's really, that's sad because the, the child could be helped. Um, but the risk is more likely than not, they're going to be told, oh, here's what you do. Let's start the child on pu puberty blockers. I, I read um, some case notes not too long ago, and this child had a pre-existing diagnosis of autism. Um, the mother had some OCD, obsessive compulsive issues going on. Clear risk for, uh, you may be more familiar with the old diagnosis, Munchausen by proxy. Um, None of that was assessed. It was noted. It was clear that it was there, but it was ignored. And, um, and the child even admitted, here's a nine-year-old boy. 
who was told that he was a female lesbian, um, he, he, he even said, I don't know the difference between reality and fantasy. And yet he was still put, he was still recommended to go down this path. So, um, so in sum, uh, to answer your question, um, there, if you bring in gender dysphoria, you're at risk here. Um, if you talk about other issues that are driving the child that might be a, a safe, somewhat of a safeguard, but um, unfortunately, the current state of the profession is going to toe this line. I spent a number of years as, as an administrator with a pediatric group, and so I want to back this up. Is it a failure on pediatricians of not spending more time? Because I would think that they would know the history of the child they should know, and they would think that they would be more objective than if you immediately go to a therapist. And I'm asking you, am I nuts? Yeah, I, that, that's a little hard for me to answer just because I'm, I'm not in the, in the, the physiological medical space. But uh, there's certainly so many entities out there that um, stand to profit uh, when we have a surgical market that's exponentially increasing uh, based on treating those with gender dysphoria, then we, we know that there's, there's potential for, for a risk. And then also you have to remember the academy and all of these, some of these groups, the AAP, <laughs> they, they're all siloed and they, they, are currently buying into this way of thinking. So I also worked on an academic journal for about 10 years. So I understand the peer reviewed process quite well. And, um, and I know what gets through into publication and I know what is rejected. And when there's a certain way of thinking, there's a certain discourse that's popular, we stick with that. And, you know, you think about, we've been down this path before. We've seen the effects of the lobotomy in the 40s, right? We, we saw Yale, all these great, our, you know, America's prized institutions heralding the lobotomy as a great practice uh, uh, to help psycho, physiological invasive intervention to help a psychological issue. And where are we today? We're instituting these really radical interventions, physiolo physiological interventions to treat a psychological issue. Professionals seem awfully quick to label something that this is evidence-based. And now then it depends on whose evidence are we basing that. And, and it's almost like, I'm expounding a little bit here, it's like, you know, fact finders. And you're saying, okay, who's doing the fact finding? And how what is their bias? Because we all have a certain level of bias. Right. So, you know, don't believe everything you hear. Yes, and they're all in a room together voting based on but based on the best available evidence not causal evidence this is cross-sectional data mostly cross-sectional data there's a there are a few studies here and there that are longer term but but as you've heard today sometimes it takes a while for the effects of of an intervention that we know that's the case whether it's physiological or psychological just the fact that you're engaging in the intervention has an effect but we don't know that because about this issue because nobody's tested that. Um, and yet these are children, right? Well, it's never popular for anyone in a group. We all know it, it is group decisions. And so to be the outstanding one that's defiant of the group decision is, is a standalone position and oftentimes very alone. Yes, it is. Anyway, we're glad you're here. Thank you for having me. All right, uh, yes, Senator Kavanaugh. Thank you. Um, Thank you for being here and, and sharing your perspective. Um, something that just kind of spurred a question while you were talking with Senator Reapy is, this is this gender affirming care, this approach is, is the national standard for care? Yes, this is based off the WPATH guidelines. Okay, so in Nebraska, if we were to change how we approach gender affirming care, we would then not be in compliance with WPATH. So I'm sorry. If we question? were to enact this legislation, we would be going in in opposite or not in opposite. We would not be in compliance with WPATH's recommendations. Right. right. You'd be more in compliance with science. Okay. 
okay. I, I, I'm more asking for the technical side of things. Okay. Um, so thank you. That's very helpful clarification. All right. I actually have a couple of questions. Yeah. Can you explain what WPATH is? Are they a government controlled entity? Are they a regulatory authority? Like I hear, I heard it a few times already today. I'm just unfamiliar with it. Yeah, they're not a government authority. They're a board that's gathered together that have basically trans activists a part of them. And they have um, developed guidelines that they believe are the way to uh, intervene for people who have gender dysphoria or, um, or some kind of distress about that their biological sex. So those folks um, have come together and they've written out their guidelines and that's pretty much what's been adopted across the world. Um, but it's not based on, um, on good sound empirical data. And every, every person is, as um, Senator Koth, um, Introduce every every person that starts to look at this data backs away from the practice because it's it's all there if you really want to see the effects of these procedures um, it's all there to see that it's not helping mental health outcomes and we do not have um, the kind of data to establish a causal relationship between gender affirming care and an outcome of robust mental health um, that it's just not there. Okay. I think Senator Reby and yourself in that conversation we're having kind of hit the nail on the head a little bit. We're starting to see, at least I think, a little bit of a trend towards um, like journals, studies and journals that are kind of driven a little bit more based on agenda or emotion sometimes from both sides. I'm not saying one side or the other. The British Journal, I think, just came out with the editor <laughs> who kind of had a lot of issues with the uh, British Journal. And then the Lancet had to retract one of their stories they not too long ago with COVID. And that's a, that's a normal thing, I think, for the Lancet. <laughs> and so I had just one question from more of a historical context. Yes. Can you explain the difference between or why between the, was it DSM-4 from the five with gender dysphoria? Was there a change there? Yeah. Was it four? I can't remember which one they were. Well, there's, there, I'll just tell you um, that there's been a lot of politics around um, the use of the diagnosis gender dysphoria. So I believe it was in 2017 that Denmark backed away from even having a diagnosis. And some of the scholars that have written um, on the transgender issue have said, we don't even think that this should be used, but the Americans need insurance reimbursement so we continue to use a gender dysphoria uh, diagnosis. So, um, Again, there's there's a lot of politicking in the medical science around uh, around real distress, around real pain. Um, I'm not sure if that clearly that answers does. your question. Yeah, but, I, I knew but, there's some kind of contextual or kind of historical difference between yes. the DSMs there at one point or another. So yeah, and the diagnosis itself is really interesting because it's based on a lot of stereotypes. Um, what you see are um, uh, things that, and that doesn't mean that it, I, I, I want to qualify that it, there is real distress for, for some folks, but um, there are also, if you look at the diagnosis, there's a lot of wiggle room, um, just like there is with any diagnosis. But when you, when you look at this one in particular, there's, there's a lot of wiggle room. And um, the other thing that's disconcerting to me is that the observation period for this diagnosis is six months. And you look at other, um, Dis, uh, disorders in the DSM that we would consider are more long-term um, or, or something that you'd, you would see over time with a person, which if you're making this kind of surgical, surgical move or something that's going to impact your body for the rest of your life, you'd want to have uh, the kind of evidence that says, oh, this is going to be stable over time. This person's not going to decide to detransition in a year. Right. I mean, I, hopefully we would all agree that we want to see some stability in the outcome. Um, but uh, what you see in the diagnosis itself, it's a six month observation time, the same for adults as it is for children. And when we look at these other disorders, um, 
that are that have that kind of characterological long-term impact, you see an observation period of at least a year with a recommendation that the diagnosis isn't typically made until the person is 18 years old. Again, with recognition that we, what we already know about the brain, which is the most crucial um, aspects of the brain, the limbic system, aren't fully developed until a person's 25 years old. And there's really good science behind that, 20,000 brain scans from the NIH. Okay, thank you for answering my question. I think you're right. Obviously, just from the testimony alone, we've heard so far there's a lot of distress involved with this. So you're right. Um, any other questions from the committee? All right, thank you very much for thank your time. You we'll take our next invited testifier. <laughs> Welcome. Chairman Hansen, members of the committee, thank you. My name is Dr. Jamie Dodge, J-A-I-M-E-D-O-D-G-E. -E. I'm speaking as a private citizen and proponent of 574. Views and opinion reflect my own and are not meant to be representative of any organization. I've been a practicing physician for 20 years and am board certified in family medicine. And as a Nebraska physician and parent, I am for the protection of children in our state. The mental health of children is a present crisis and children experiencing gender questioning and gender dysphoria are particularly vulnerable and in need of your help. I feel strongly that this measure will help protect them from unnecessary harm. And patients, families, and clinicians cannot make informed healthcare decisions without knowing the likely benefits and the potential harms of the various interventions. We have gaps in our knowledge at present as to which interventions are actually the most effective and the long-term outcomes of those interventions. This is due in part to a lack of a standard approach to treatment of children experiencing gender dysphoria in the US, as well as a lack of long-term, well-designed studies as to the outcomes of said treatments. We recognize the importance of the assessment and care of children's mental health prior to any pharmaceutical or surgical interventions. Multiple US medical societies agree on this. Presently, however, European countries considered pioneers in transgender care have changed their course to emphasize psychological treatment in children and to prescribe puberty blockers only in very severe cases or to simply stop prescribing them completely. The Swedish health authorities have deemed risk of treatments with puberty blockers and gender affirming hormonal treatment currently outweigh possible benefits. And we ask whether we should follow their example. We recognize that children questioning their gender are at particular risk for suicide. Seeking to intervene to improve and save the lives of those children, we must consider the research on the relationship between adolescent cross-sex intervention and mental health. We observe that since the introduction and widespread use of puberty blockers, and particularly in those uh, states that allow greater access to those treatments, suicide rates among young people have increased. Research shows that cross-sex interventions do not provide convincing evidence of improvements in mental health, as very few studies actually make comparisons to a control group. Suicide rates remain markedly elevated above the background population after gender reassignment surgeries have been performed. The measure before you would pause our current approach and allow us to fill the gaps in our knowledge, focus care on social and emotional development and mental health, and pursue further studies on the long-term effects of medical and surgical interventions. Thank you. All right, thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? You're off the hook. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll take our next invited testimony and support. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Jeannie Grison, and I'm a pharmacist. I'm also a hormone specialist through PCCA, specializing in bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. I'm here today to provide information regarding hormone therapies, including estrogen, testosterone, spironolactone, and puberty blockers. These drugs should not be used in children for gender-affirming therapy. Despite the warnings, these hormones are included in protocols at UNMC, as well as the WPATH standards of care version eight. Gender-affirming care uses high doses of hormones. High doses can create a plethora of unwanted side effects. 
um, and have detrimental effects on health. I've provided you with information on the long list of side effects and risks involved with these medications. When girls are given testosterone, irreversible damage can occur, such as deepening um, the voice, body and facial hair growth, scalp hair loss, and infertility. Emotionally, testosterone can create agitation, anger, and irritability. Withdrawal can occur with abrupt discontinuation and the patient can experience major depression, restlessness, irritability, and insomnia. Halted growth has been reported in adolescent boys and girls. Boys given high estrogen are at risk of blood clots, gallbladder disease, diabetes, and migraines. Pediatric use and safety has not been established. What has been seen in adults can be extrapolated to children, including growth of certain tumors. Estrogen should only be used in children when clearly indicated. Of note is that estrogen use can result in short adult stature if treatment is started before the end of puberty. Both estrogen and testosterone can cause cardiovascular events, including stroke and death. Spironolactone is added to the regimen to block testosterone, resulting in breast enlargement. However, this drug has been shown to be cancer causing. This alone should be reason enough not to use in children. This drug can cause mental confusion, headache, and drowsiness. Last, luprolide or lupron is used to stop puberty and development. The long-term effects of this drug in children is unknown, but may include a further compromise in adult stature. Although no, no clinical studies have been completed to determine if fertility is reversible, animal studies have shown recovery while immature rats were shown no recovery after the medication is stopped. This class of medication can include psychological side effects of anger, aggression, depression, nervousness, and even suicide. To cover the full extent of these medications would take many hours. The published data shows these medications are dangerous to use in children or the data is lacking in some cases. This type of therapy will undoubtedly create a patient for life, whether it's continuing the therapies or to treat the damages done by these therapies. Medical professionals need to look at their oath of do no harm. While claiming to be wise, they became fools. All right, thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. All right, we'll take our next invited testifier. Good afternoon, Chairman Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Marion Miner, M-A-R-I-O-N, M-I-N-E-R. I'm here on behalf of the Nebraska Catholic Conference to express our support for LB 574. <clears throat> As theories of sex and gender inconsistent with nature and the natural moral law are increasingly prevalent in popular culture, it is essential for the law to protect children while they develop and mature physiologically, emotionally, and spiritually. Opponents of LB 574 will argue that they wish to affirm the equal dignity of and society's respect for persons who feel a sense of incongruence between their biological sex and the gender with which they identify, which of course is often accompanied by feelings of anxiety and of being unaccepted. Love, compassion, and respect for such persons who are our brothers and sisters, along with an affirmation of their equal dignity and worth is due to them. With this affirmation, we fully agree. Pope Francis has spoken with feeling on this issue on several occasions. Speaking on what he has called the ideology of gender, he reminds us that it is one thing to be understanding of human weakness and the complexities of life, and another to accept ideologies that attempt to sunder what are inseparable aspects of reality. Elsewhere, he describes this gender ideology as an expression by the contemporary world of frustration and resignation, which seeks to cancel out sexual difference because it no longer knows how to confront it. Sex is a bodily and biological reality and whether we receive it and respect it matters. Gender is how we give social expression to that reality. A healthy culture promotes the integrity of persons in part by cultivating manifestations of sex differences that correspond with biological realities. It supports gender expressions that reveal and communicate the reality of our sexual natures. 
A misguided concept of gender, on the other hand, denies, conceals, and distorts the realities of our nature and hinders human flourishing. Most alarmingly, it exposes emotionally vulnerable children to dangerous and sometimes irreversible wounding of their own bodies, permanently engaging in battle against what will be the, life, the body's lifelong struggle to heal itself. What LB 574 refers to as gender altering procedures are not treatments of any pathology. They suppress normal and healthy bodily development, interfere with the normal and healthy functioning of the human body, and alter or remove healthy organs and tissues. The acts themselves harm the body and heal nothing. Violations of the principles of medical ethics have been become more tolerated in recent years. They should not be tolerated when it comes to children, especially when the consequences can be permanent. We urge the committee, therefore, to advance LB 574. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Kavanaugh. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Um, I just noticed that your references to Pope Francis are from 2016 and 2015 mm -hmm. and not in reference to his most recent statements just days ago. Sure. Would you like me to address those? I, I think that would be <laughs> give us a fuller picture of Yeah. So uh, the reference that Pope Francis made a few days ago uh, was uh, to the fact that he did not think it would be productive for countries to criminalize homosexuality. Those were the effort. Th those were the. Uh, references that he made. Thank you. That's not what we're dealing with here. Right. right. I just want, I feel like it, to do justice to the Pope's views, we should make sure that we're doing justice to them and that he also says that we need to treat the LGBTQ community with compassion and not as though they are sinners. I'm not. One, that, I'm 100%. Just, yeah. ju I just wanted that said for the record. And I also think this is a great opportunity, if you don't mind, for me to reiterate that anybody here today in this room or outside of this room that is struggling and needs help to please text start to 678-678 or call one 866 Four eight eight seven three eight six. Again, if you are struggling, you are not alone. Please call one eight six six four eight eight seven three eight six. Thank you, Mr. Minor, for bearing with me. Thank you, Senator Kavanaugh. Any other questions from the committee? All right, seeing none. Banking. Thank you. All right, we'll take the next invited testimony. Hello, committee. My name is Sue Greenwald, S-U-E-G-R-E-E-N-W-A-L-D. As a pediatrician who spent 35 years taking care of abused children, I'm old enough to remember when the general mutilation of minors was considered child abuse, but that was before it became insanely profitable. In Ob Obamacare in 2010 mandated the coverage of transgender procedures, and at that time, it affected only about one in 10,000 people. But now every major university hospital has a transgender clinic with a menu of surgeries offered. Last year, Vanderbilt University exposed the field as a big money maker and said entire hospitals can be supported by these surgeries as they require multiple follow-ups. That means that people are not cured by these surgeries. Instead, they become lifelong patients requiring more surgeries to fix the complications. Luring in young patients before they can understand the adult consequences keeps the profit coming in. Dissenting doctors are threatened and silenced, many of them who would otherwise be here today. <coughs> Major medical associations depend on these universities for membership and, and donations, so they decided they could live with defining gender affirmation as telling a girl she is a boy and conversion therapy as telling a girl she is a girl. In fact, the 2018 American Academy of Pediatrics report for gender affirming care, which is often quoted by court judges and policymakers, was actually written by one doctor and approved by the same doctor, and he is a gender care specialist. Planned Parenthood is selling cross-sex hormones promoting gender ideology in schools through their CSE curriculum, which was recently thwarted in much of Nebraska. And in some states, the Planned Parenthood clinics are moving offices right into the schools, which overcomes the problem of patients too young to drive themselves across town. Hormones are lifelong treatment. The younger the patient, the longer you can profit from them. And drug companies are not complaining. This windfall to the medical industry is coming from your insurance premiums and Medicaid taxes, 
as these treatments are all mandated. Who could have guessed in 2010 that an entire industry would be created from a loophole designed to help a few disenfranchised people? And starting as young as age three in some of these clinics, a high percentage of the affected youth suffer from autism or childhood trauma. All they want to be is accepted. Some are socially awkward and they're convinced by peers that their problems will go away if they just change their body. The peer groups, both at school and online, tell them we'll accept you and we'll celebrate you, but only if you'll change your body to, to, uh, to comport with what we would like to see. And some teachers in those schools stand ready with a trans closet and willingness to keep secrets. School counselors are being trained to isolate the child from the parents and support the transition. The pipeline goes from school to the clinic and a family suffer. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we'll see We'll see if there's any questions from the committee here. Yes, yes. Senator Walls. I, I just want to kind of piggyback off of the question that uh, Senator Hansen had uh, a little while ago regarding uh, visits to pediatricians. And if, if you have a a young person that comes to your office and um, talks about having social dis difficulties and you know maybe thoughts of suicide. Can you kind of talk about the process that you go through with that family? Are you are you talking about a, per a person coming in saying they're suicidal? suicidal? Is that what you're asking? Right. Having the, I mean, we've heard from you know four or five testifiers that we're in some deep depression. So as children coming in to see you, what kind of process do you take the family through to help them? You know, in my 35 years of practice, I've never had somebody come in and say I'm suicidal. They, they are um, having problems sleeping. They're um, getting into trouble. They're getting on drugs. They're hanging out with the wrong friends. Their grades are dropping. Um, the signs are always peripheral. It's um, uh, it, it's it's not as um, as cut and dried as people would like to think. I don't know if that answers your question. No, not really. It's okay. That's all right. I'll see if I can find the right. Yes, Senator Reepy. Thank you, Chairman Hanson. Uh, as a pediatrician, you know other pediatricians. How many of your patients would come in there and? And express to you their concerns and their questions, and then how do you address those um, in terms of what they should do, where they should go? Do you have them come back and do you spend routinely, or is it much like many pediatric offices? It's routine, this is your three month, this is your six, this is your annual, yada, yada, yada. Um, given that I, um, I, I treated traumatized children, my practice was a little different than a lot of the average practices. And, um, and I did address a lot of those issues. Um, it's off the topic, but a real challenge in our area in Kearney is having mental health practitioners to refer those people to. Um, and uh, many times they had to be referred to someone in Omaha or Lincoln. Um, and, uh, you know, I, retired from general practice about five years ago. And, and as I said, this really wasn't an issue. A, a transgender wasn't talked about five years ago. Um, gender dysphoria was an extremely, extremely rare condition five years ago. Uh, but the social contagion that we are uh, experiencing now has made it a forefront uh, thing. And, and, and five years ago, people talked about things like anorexia, um, and there were, other, there were other ways that children express their anxiety than gender dysphoria. That was an extremely rare condition five years ago. What impact do you feel social media has on it? A huge effect because um, social media is ubiquitous now and kids who are depressed and isolated, they turn to social media for company. Um, the social media, um, particularly TikTok will if a child looks up gender dysphoria or, or transgender or anything related, it has an algorithm to take them down the rabbit hole. And, uh, and it's extremely damaging. And I'm sure that, that the 
fact that so many children now have cell phones and access to social media is part of why we find ourselves in this position. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kavanaugh. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, do you consider being gay to be a social contagion? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Do you consider homosexuality a social contagion? That you th do I think that homosexuality is more likely to make children transgender? No. Do you do you view it as a social contagion? Are people gay because it's of a social contagion? Of course not. No. Well, people used to think used to say exactly what you're saying about being transgender, so that's why I asked the question. Oh, uh, oh no. I mean, I mean, five years ago, who mentioned the word gender? It was you were male or female. It just it wasn't. It, this is. Um, this is a social construct that has been invented. And as I testified, uh, the Obamacare law said in 2010 that transgender procedures would be uh, covered, but they actually didn't start being covered in 2017. So in 2017 so I, is when point, all these clinics geared sure. up. My, and, and I appreciate that, part of your testimony. I was just, I asked and you answered my question. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. And I know we have a few more invited testimony to go. So just so we make sure we have time for the general public to speak as well. I wouldn't say hurry, but <laughs> we'll try to make sure we kind of narrow it the best we can, especially if we've heard testimony already once before. With that, <laughs> welcome. Oop. Um, hello, my name is uh, Julia Emerson, um, J-U-L-I-A-E-M-E-R-S-O-N. I'm a family physician from Western Nebraska. I mentioned that my views are my own and not necessarily the views of my employer, and I have no conflicts of interest. I'd like to address today the health risk of both the medical and surgical gender-affirming treatments that are being offered to children and adolescents. So there's essentially three major experimental treatment options. Uh, first are pu puberty blockers, which you've heard um, already spoken about today. Hormones used basically chemical castration. They're being prescribed to otherwise healthy, gender-confused children at a, age, at a young age to block the development of male or female physical characteristics. Uh, to date, there's no sufficient research that's been done to show the long-term side effects beyond 12 months. Short-term side effects are many. Um, you've heard some osteoporosis, mood changes, um, depression, increased suicidality, uh, which many of these children are already dealing with. Um, there's also some possible slowing of brain development. The FDA recently warned about a condition uh, uh, consisting of brain swelling and vision loss, liver damage, seizures, heart damage, uh, also the potential for permanent sterility when combined with cross-sex hormone treatment. So that is the second treatment option, estrogen and testosterone, which uh, also carry a lot of risks of blood clotting, high cholesterol, weight gain, mood changes, diabetes, stroke, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and infertility, also increasing in certain cancers. Um, many of these risks are higher than at naturally occurring levels in adult cis males and females. There's no studies on the long-term effects when starting these drugs in childhood and adolescence. And finally, sex reassignment surgeries. Um, this is permanent. And these surgeries are prone to serious complications, causing victims to be lifelong patients of a medical system that has been too quick to cater to gender ideologues. These procedures essentially remove healthy, functioning body parts to be replaced with ineffective imposters. Female to male surgery in particular is very risky. It requires making a penis and scrotum from, a, uh, from muscles and skin taken from arms and legs. Many complications, which include a lack of blood flow to the new organ or new graft, urinary dysfunction, including permanent incontinence, chronic pain, non-healing wounds, graft rejection, open fistulas, allowing urine and feces to leak into other body parts. The penis and clitoris that are formed are often non-sensory and non-functional. The result of reassignment surgeries is permanent sterility. The complications lead to more surgery, more dissatisfaction, regret, isolation, depression, and suicidality. The very things the transgender treatments were supposed to remedy. I urge you to support Bill 574 and protect children. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Reeve. Thank you. Uh, my question is, since as a practicing physician, and if you had a case, would you recommend that 
you do a, a, I don't know whether there would be a sperm count that would be could be collected and frozen over eggs, so that at some time in the future, maybe they want to be a, a parent and they have, have a child that has their eyes and has their characteristics. I know that that some centers that are doing um, transgender reassignment surgeries do offer, um, you know, egg collection and sperm collection. Um, you know, it's costly. Yes. Um, it's not always successful. You have to probably have a surrogate uh, in order to accomplish that. Probably limited facilities that would be able to accommodate that as well. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. you. Yes. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. I'll take the next invited testifier. Thank Welcome. you. You're good okay. to go. Uh, my name is Jenna Durr, J-E-N-N-A-D-E-R-R, -E -R -R, and I'm a physician. I speak on behalf of myself today, and I support LB 574. When I became a physician, I took an oath to first do no harm, and today I choose to speak publicly because children in our state must be protected. There are other physicians who would like to be here today but are not because they are fearful of professional repercussions. Today you'll hear testimony in opposition to this bill, and the opposition may reference and quote, commonly depended upon research to support their position. I would like to quickly review two of these foundational studies, and I've, in I've included additional studies and an in-depth analysis for you all to review later. A pair of Dutch studies published in 2011 and 2014 are routinely cited and used to support gender-affirming care in the U.S. These studies have significant flaws. They were funded by a personal grant to one researcher from a for-profit company whose funders are undisclosed and therefore conflicts of interest cannot be determined. The initial flaws also include the following, small sample size, lack of long-term follow-up, and lack of a control group. There were 70 participants in the first study and 55 in the second. Participants were surveyed upon initial evaluation at the gender identity clinic prior to initiation of cross-sex hormone treatment and then after gender reassignment surgery about one and a half years later. Participants were not followed into adulthood, that is, thus it's unclear how future relationships, experiences, and sterility may affect their perception of well-being. Additionally, all participants underwent medical intervention. A significant flaw is related to the measurement tool used to assess gender dysphoria, which led to the conclusion of the study that gender dysphoria resolved after gender reassignment surgery. However, the initial measurement tool was not the same as the final measurement tool, thus nullifying the results of this widely referenced and depended upon research. Another issue is that participants who experienced medical or psychological complications were excluded from the study, therefore skewing the results in a positive direction. Those who were not included as participants were simply noted to be non-participants. What happened to these people? Additionally, all participants were required to undergo intensive psychosocial therapy. It's impossible to determine how much of an effect this played in any positive outcomes. Likewise, there wasn't a control group who underwent psychosocial therapy without medical intervention, which may also be helpful in determining the necessity of medical intervention, if at all. Additionally, the Dutch approach to adolescence is different from the U.S., so conclusions are difficult to generalize. The Amsterdam Gender Identity Clinic does not provide physical medical interventions before puberty, and parents are advised in watchful waiting. Adolescents are only considered eligible for puberty suppression when they're diagnosed with gender, gender identity disorder, live in a supportive environment, and have no serious psychosocial problems interfering with the diagnosis of treatment protocol. If there are problems identified that may interfere with the physical medical intervention, treatment is actually postponed. In summary, considering these two studies to be foundational and reliable is concerning at best, and there are multiple reasons to be cautious. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Reapy. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Um, my question is this, I know it's your first line, which I get read through. Uh, you're a physician. Are you a family medicine? Though? I am a family medicine physician. Okay. Uh -huh. Good for you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? No. Seeing none. Thank you. Okay. All right. We'll take our next invited testifier. Oh, good afternoon, senators. My name is Dr. Linda Vermutten, L I N D A V E R M O O T E N. I practice as a clinician counseling for 27 years, primarily with trauma. My specialty was working with um, childhood sexual survivors and rape. And so this comes into play a lot when we're talking about this whole gender identity, because when you begin to do the research, you find that a lot of people 
that are coming into this category have experienced a trauma of being raped um, during their childhood. So you have to ask the question, if you were raped during your childhood, and often that's by someone in their own home, a parent, a sibling, or somebody close to them, is that going to impact the way that you think? Absolutely, because you're trying to defend yourself. So if I can become the gender of the one that is hurting me, that's going to make me powerful. That's going to prevent me, and that's going to pre protect me from this ever happening again. If I become that gender, then do I, in effect, become unattractive, so therefore I will not be attacked anymore. These are some of the questions that have been asked in the practice, in the setting. So we see that children are most open to suggestion. We also know that um, adolescents, we're fickle. We want one thing in the morning, one thing in the afternoon, one thing that night, and one thing the next morning, and it's not the same. There's no consistency at that age because our brains are not fully developed yet. What science tells us is that for women, your brain is not fully developed until your early 20s, about 22, 24. And for men, it does not happen until age 26. Now we want to take a decision that is going to be life-altering to a child for the rest of their life and allow them to make this decision when their brain does not have a capacity to think things through. There's a multiplicity of things that we don't allow children to do because we don't believe that they are mentally competent. They can't smoke, they can't buy cigarettes, they can't buy alcohol, they can't drive, they can't vote, they can't legally get married because there's an age of consent when we assume that people can make a decision. And our practice and our profession does not help us. Why there are not many more of us here today? Because one of the things that the profession says in this whole arena is you're not allowed to speak to your client about alternatives if they raise the question of dysphoria. So when you're prevented from addressing other alternatives, what choice do you have? Not much. And it's not saying that we are not saying that this individual can never have a surgery. What we're saying is let them go up until an age when they can clearly have more mental capacity, although their brain is not yet fully developed at age 19, they have a better, better chance of making an accurate decision. Just because we can do something, does that mean we should do something? There's a lot of children that are very suggestive, like autistic children and mismatches that are pulled into these groups and they begin to be manipulated by their peers that say, well, we accept you. If you, you're just like us, you need to hang out with us. And they pull in all the people that don't fit anywhere else. And so then it's by suggestion. And they're very open to suggestion. I, thank you, doctor, for your testimony. Your red light is on. Excuse me. And I can get a glass of water. You're fine. It's good timing. All right. Well, let's see if there's any questions from the committee. Yes, Senator Day. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention as a woman who was a victim of child sexual assault and someone who is also neurodivergent, that we are fully capable Sorry, of making you. decisions for ourselves. And sometimes conflating trauma to gender dysphoria can be really problematic for people who are watching. So for anyone who is watching, just because you are a victim of child sexual assault or also neurodivergent does not mean that you are not capable of making decisions about your own life. That is true, however, if your brain is the developed senator, then how do you make an accurate, informed decision? As being a survivor myself, if I were growing up today... I don't know, I had a question for you. I just wanted to make okay. a statement. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions from the committee? <laughs> All right, seeing none, thank you. And again, we'll try to remember to kind of keep our voices down if we can, please. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon, Senator Hansen, and members of the committee. My name is Karen Bowling, K-A-R-E-N, B-O-W-L-I-N-G, and I serve as the Executive Director of Nebraska Family Alliance. We support LB 574. When a child is struggling, she needs compassionate care that supports human flourishing for a lifetime. We recognize this is a difficult issue for families and believe that every child has intrinsic value created in the image of God and must be treated with dignity and respect. 
There has not been adequate research on the use of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. What we do know reveals that there may be long-term, even potentially irreversible consequences to which children are not ready or able to meaningfully provide consent, both legally and cognitively. The first study of medicine is do no harm. LB 574 is reasonable, thoughtful public policy that ensures Nebraska's children receive help when needed without permanent harm, treatment, not transition. Minors in Nebraska are not eligible to make other life-altering decisions as previous testifiers have stated. Regret is real. Many transgender identified people eventually discover transitioning does not solve the distress they feel about their bodies, and they make the decision to return to identifying as their biological sex. They often explain they were never offered comprehensive psychological care before they were referred to for puberty blockers, hormonal care, and medical procedures that could not be rectified when they changed their minds. Carabell, now 25 years old, had a similar journey and on December 1st, 2020, won a lawsuit against Gender Identity Development Service. Bell claimed doctors should have challenged her more about the decision to transition before starting medical treatment as a minor diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Puberty blockers are associated with significant neurological and bodily harms. They have been observed to increase depression symptoms and harm bone development, and see my noted citations. Nebraska has a compelling interest in protecting its citizens from harm, particularly our children. This is why child welfare laws, child labor laws, and worker health and safety codes exist. LB 574 addresses a child safety issue, and it's our duty to protect every precious boy and girl. Nebraska Kids Count. Thank you for your time. I'll take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Kavanaugh. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, in your testimony, you stated that uh, that they often explain they were never offered comprehensive psychological care. Um, who is who is they? Who are you referencing? Well, I thank you, thank you, Senator Kavanaugh, for that question. And as some of our previous uh, people that now identify as detransitioners, they I think explain very thoroughly that currently a lot of the prescriptions that are to be given and Sorry, advice. My, my question is, who is the they you are referencing? Uh, mental health providers. So, I mean, are you are you referencing children in Nebraska? Yes. So, so I will just tell you, um, thank you for clarifying your question, Senator. It is a common question and call that we get to our office. Do you have counselors that you can refer to us? Our, we're in a situation as a family, and we understand how difficult that is as a family because they want another counselor because who they went to only offered one and then do you ref then do you refer them to another counselor yes if we have opportunity we absolutely if we've been invited to do so we do okay and then you mentioned someone by the name of Kira Bell is this person from Nebraska Did she, this she is you? not from Nebraska okay I'm trying to I'm trying to decipher from our testimonies what has happened in Nebraska. So that's why I'm asking these questions about. I will note, um, Senator Kavanaugh, I think that is really important. And some of our detransitioners here today are from Nebraska, yes. but we're not asked. So thank you for oh, they clarifying meant, that. They mentioned that they were from yeah. Nebraska, so I didn't feel okay. it. But, thank you. Thank you. Yes. I, I, I'm trying to clarify when when it's not clear to me. But OK, so, so your organization does refer families that are seeking that have been informed that their child may be experiencing gender dysmorphia and they want to seek a different type of care than what's initially been offered to them. They reach out to your organization and you are able to refer them to a, a mental health provider that maybe more suits the needs of the entire family. Whenever we can, we do. It depends upon the request of the parent. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you are able to. We do have it is very limited here in the state of Nebraska, okay. unfortunately. 
the number of providers or um, the care that families may be requesting. Okay. I just want to make sure that when families are, at, and we heard from a parent mm -hmm. that they were not in line with the, the, the advice that was being given, given to them. And a lot of this particular bill is over parental control and healthcare decisions. And so I just want to make sure, and I think I'm hearing from you an affirmative that when parents are getting counseling that they don't feel is appropriate for their child, um, that they have another avenue and that they have actually turned to your organization to help direct them to that mental health care that they feel is more appropriate for their family. And I, I think that you're saying yes. Does that seem like we're, we're understanding <laughs> yeah. each other? Okay. Yeah, I, I understand where you're coming. And my answer is, is just as I stated, whenever we can, I will be honest with you, Senator Kavanaugh, the uh, pool to, to come from um, is not as easy as I thought it would be sure. in this current culture. We have, yeah. we have a workforce shortage in everything. Yes. So thank you mm -hmm. for your testimony. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, thank, thank you. you. We'll take our next invited testimony. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. My name is David Begley, D-A-V-I-D-B-E-G-L-E-Y. I'm an attorney in Omaha and I was educated by the Society of Jesus in Omaha. In his state of the state address to the legislature, the Oklahoma governor said, we must protect our most vulnerable, our children. After all, minors can't vote, can't purchase alcohol, can't purchase cigarettes. <clears throat> we shouldn't allow a minor to get a permanent gender altering surgery in Oklahoma. To that, I would add no puberty blockers. The New York Times likes to think of itself as the paper of record in the United States. Most people would agree with me that the New York Times is one of the most liberal organizations in America, in America today. So I took note when the New York Times published a story on November 14, 2022, which stated, quote, concerns are growing among some medical professionals about the consequences of the drugs and, quote, there is growing evidence of potential harm from puberty blockers. The bottom line here is that puberty blockers to minors is experimental. After World War II, the civilized world agreed that it was unethical to perform medical experiments on humans, especially on children. General George Marshall was one of the uh, leaders of the military in World War II and thereafter, he was a five-star general made many life-altering decisions there as General and Secretary of State. And he would ask himself, what if I am wrong? And I would submit that the doctors that are doing this stuff and their parents that are consenting to this, they need to ask themselves, what if I am wrong about this decision regarding my child? Now, I attached to my testimony some questionnaires, which are on the website in Nebraska Medicine. I uh, uh, presume that they were given puberty blockers at Nebraska Medicine and possibly doing gender reassignment surgery. We heard from someone here today said that it is going on. And I'm calling on the Attorney General or the State Patrol to investigate. And if Nebraska Medicine performed medical experiments on children, those people need to be fired. And, um, and I would submit to you that if they have informed consents in their file signed by their parents, that's legally ineffective. You can't consent to your kid to have irreversible permanent physical damage. That's just legally ineffective. So as others have stated, the state of Nebraska has a compelling interest in protecting children, minors, from medical experimentation that can cause permanent physical harm. You've heard all from the other doctors, bone problems, brain development, it's just, this is just morally evil. It's got to be stopped. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions from the committee? Senator Ricky? Senator Hanson, thank you. Um, my only question is, what's your line of specialty as an attorney? Well, I, I've done a lot of things. I actually did medical malpractice defense, commercial litigation. Right now I'm doing elder law and estate planning, but I, I still do some other litigation okay. in real estate. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. 
right. We'll take our next invited testimony, please. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Jeanette Cooper, J-E-A-N-N-E-T-T-E-C-O-O-P-E-R, and I'm here to support LB 574 on behalf of Partners for Ethical Care, a secular, nonpartisan, all-volunteer nonprofit organization. I am a mother. It is the greatest fear of every parent to outlive her own child. It makes sense for a parent to choose transition when they are faced with that choice from unethical and misinformed professionals. It makes sense for a mother to choose a sterile, de-sexed child over a dead child. It makes sense for a parent to consent to the removal of healthy breasts rather than the removal of her daughter's body from the morgue. But if a therapist, social worker, or doctor gives you or anyone else this scenario and implies that if you do not consent to these harmful interventions, then you'll be responsible for your child's death, I want you to report them to the state licensing board for unethical care. I have had parents do so. This form is on the state's website. Citizens have a duty to assist the government in one of its major roles, to regulate licensed professionals. This is what this bill is about. The government is in charge of protecting consumers from unethical practices and unscrupulous providers of any product or service. That is what this is about. The suicide myth assumes only two options, transition or suicide. It is a false dichotomy. There is always more than two options. But stopping normal puberty, administering cross-sex hormones, and removing healthy body parts should never be an option. I help run an online group of thousands of parents, some of whom are in this room, and they do not affirm their child's transgender identity. Rather, we support our children's social, emotional, psychological, and physical needs as human beings. And every day we have more and more reports of children who have desisted from their transgender identity. We let our kids wear what they want, cut their hair any way they please. We are liberal, like me, and conservative. We are atheist, like me, and religious. We are diverse. I am not aware of any children of parents in our group who have committed suicide because they were not affirmed. In other private online groups that I personally am in, we read accounts of parents who affirm their child's transgender identity, but their children still committed suicide. I have read many. The promises of transition joy did not save their lives. It was snake oil. What actually helps children who are struggling with psychological distress and has the best evidence is cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, which would address the emotional reasoning that their children are using. Emotional reasoning is saying that because I feel something, it must be true. Feeling like a girl is an example of this. That's why the affirmation model doesn't prevent suicide. It's a feeling in somebody's mind. There's nothing physically wrong with their bodies. When my daughter expressed thoughts of suicide, I spent a full day with a suicidologist. Suicide is complex. It doesn't involve legislative testimony. That will never cause someone suicide. I learned that in order to have a completed suicide, according to Jack Clot, a suicidologist with over 45 years of experience, a person will have all four of these things. One, hopelessness. Two, aloneness, isolation, and a feeling of abandonment. Three, self-hatred. And four, the inability to cope. I, I hate to cut you off. You're, you're going for it. <laughs> but the red light is on, so sorry. Um, are there any questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. We'll take the next invited testifier. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us here today, committee and Senator Hansen. Um, my name is Russ Barger, R U S S B A R G E R. Uh, I'm an attorney here in the state, and my entity is, or my testimony is my own. I'm not operating on behalf of anyone else. LB 574 provides additional legal protection to children. You know, as I sit here watching this testimony and thinking about what you have to deal with, there's two words that come to mind, courage and duty. Not only you, but the rest of the body are going to have to summon both of those things to do the right thing. Um, Nebraska's elected officials have a right and a duty to protect minors' health and safety. It's clear from the case law that states have the final say as to the parameters of health and safety of their citizens. That includes setting out the standard of care. A couple things that I need to mention to the uh, committee that maybe you haven't heard yet, because there's probably going to be things from the opponents talking about how 
other states have enjoined parts or entirely the laws that'll be similar to this, uh, you still have to summon that courage to do the right thing. So the things you're going to need to do or have removed, for example, but a minor born as a female is not permitted to seek that same medical treatment because the minor's sex at birth determines whether or not the minor can receive certain types of medical care under the law. This statute discriminates on the basis of sex. That's under Brandt versus Rutledge. That's an Eighth Circuit decision. We are under the Eighth Circuit. 19 states attorneys general are opposing this decision. Its lack of logic is breathtaking to me. What this reminds me of as I watch this play out is our, par our partial birth abortion battle uh, over a decade ago. Partial birth abortion proponents use similar industry-driven experts to strike down Nebraska's partial birth <laughs> abortion ban. The industry experts claim theoretical instances where the DNX procedure was the only one that was available and necessary for certain women. They couldn't really identify any of them, but they said it could happen. Later, Congress made factual findings saying DNX was never necessary, and the Supreme Court upheld the federal version of that law. You need to make sure that you have the correct statements of fact to support whatever it is. You have people who are sterile. You have people who are irreversibly harmed. I need you to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? <laughs> Seeing none, thank you. Just a few left. We'll take the next invited testifier. Hello, thank you, Senators. Uh, my name is Joseph Molka, uh, J-O-S-E-P-H-M-U-L-K-A. Um, I've been a practicing physician in Lincoln for 11 years. I'm board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, as well as holding a doctorate in biomedical engineering. My wife and I have eight children. I am here today offering my own testimony um, for myself. It does not reflect the views of my employer. I'm here today to give my support to LB 574. The state of Nebraska prohibits any person under the age of 21 to consume alcoholic beverages and pro prohibits any person over the age of 21 to provide alcoholic beverages to a person under the age of 21. As a physician, this law implies to me that the state of Nebraska views persons under the age of 21 as not having reached an age where they are capable of making the decision to consume a substance that has the capacity to alter the future course of their life through the potential physical consequences of death or disability to themselves or others, or the potential legal consequences that possible felony charges could have on their ability to pursue certain careers. In this way, the state of Nebraska and its laws seeks to protect the vulnerable from making life-altering decisions until they have reached an age at which they are fully capable of discerning all of the possible consequences of their actions. Senators, I believe that we, as representatives of the people of Nebraska in law and medicine, have the responsibility to provide the same level of protection to children seeking medical treatment that will permanently alter their bodies, affect their ability to father or mother a child, or potentially set them up for numerous medical complications relating to unnecessary and major elective surgery. In my medical practice, I have countless patients relate to me that they regret certain decisions they made in their youth out of ignorance that have affected their life as an adult. These are primarily in relation to musculoskeletal conditions and consequences related to obesity, which pale in comparison to the potential anguish, depression, and anxiety that may stem from altering certain characteristics of their appearance or sexual functioning. In the same way that the laws of the state of Nebraska protect children from having persons provide them with alcoholic beverages, we as representatives of the people of Nebraska should protect our children from parents or legal guardians who would consent to having these permanent body altering medical procedures performed on their children. As a community, we are raising the next generation of Nebraskans. I support LB 574 because as a physician, I believe it to be our moral and ethical duty to do so. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you.
And just for everyone's, uh, so everyone kind of knows, the hearing room 1510 is now open as a second overflow room. I know we have one overflow room currently, and it's pretty warm in there. I was just stepped in there for a little bit. It's like an oven. So in case you want to get out of there and go somewhere different, and for everybody in this room, but also everyone watching on TV here in the Capitol, room 1510 is now open as a second overflow room if you want to go down there. All right. And with that, the next invited testifier, welcome. Thank you. My name is Stephanie Johnson, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. And I am here on behalf of Nebraskans for Founders Values. I just thank you, Senator Hansen, and the rest of the committee for the opportunity to come speak. I am just really a proponent of this bill and honored just to be here to protect our children from this. Um, according to Reuters.com that was published in 2021, the number of children ages 6 to 17 identified with gender dysphoria has quadrupled, and that was from 2017 to 2021. And the, from ages 6 to 17, the number tripled that were children using hormone therapy, hormone blockers. I want to just tell you a little bit about myself. I have, there's so much research, but you've heard so much today. Because of all of this going on in our society, a situation in my own life was brought back to my remembrance from when I was 12 years old. And I asked my mom about it two years ago. And all of this was escalating and there were gender clinics popping up all over the country and all these children and little girls wanting to become boys. And I asked my mom if she remembered when I was 12 and I was doing sit-ups every night. I would go run around our block as fast as I could. I was a tomboy and I was very underdeveloped and I was proud of being a tomboy. And I did not, I saw my friends starting to go through puberty and getting breasts and getting, they were developing. I was not, and I didn't want to. And so I was doing all these things to try not to go through puberty. And I held it in and it scared me because I thought, what is wrong with me? And I remember my going up to the kitchen and asking my mom and telling her the truth about why I was doing all the things I was doing is because I didn't want to go through puberty. I, I liked being a tomboy. I played with all the boys at recess. I did all of that. And she said, honey, let's talk about it. We did. She said, you're athletic. You're a tomboy. And I was fast forward until I was, you know, 14, 15. I started liking dresses. I started being able to fix my hair, wearing makeup. But guess what? I put on my baseball hat. And I would go out to the field and I would do all the things. I'm from Western Nebraska. So I had my tomboy side and I had my girly side. And if I were to tell that story right now as a 12 year old little girl in front of the, the opponents to this bill, I would be a perfect candidate for gender dysphoria. I would have had gender dysphoria. And I, I don't know what the damage would have been done to me. I would have agreed to it. I tell you that right now, hands down. I would have agreed to it because I didn't want to become a voluptuous woman. So I just want you to consider that and save little girls like me who just need a time to grow. Consider that, please, and don't give them experimental drugs that will change their life forever. So let them grow. Thank you. Okay, hang on for one second. Yes, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, we'll see if there's any questions from the committee. Any, any questions from the committee? Okay. Well, seeing none, All thank right. you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll take the, should be the last invited proponent testimony, if there is one. Proponent, proponent yep. I don't know if we have any more invited testimony. I just want to make sure if we have any more invited testimony. It looks like we don't. Okay, good. All right. So now we'll take the next proponent. We'll take from this side of the room first, the next proponent testifier. <laughs> All right, we'll get started here in just a second. Let's kind of settle down here a little bit. And in case there are some people who did testify, if they want to go in one of the overflow rooms, they're more than welcome to and open this up a little bit, or they can stay here. I think we're doing pretty good. 
so far. just about ready okay and if i can say one more thing just a pet peeve of mine when we stand up out of the chairs the thing sends a smack in the back of it and we can hear pretty loud so if you can't just maybe hold on to the chair when you kind of get up that might help cut down some of the noise though so all right we're all ready to go all right welcome thank you welcome below senators uh i'm a uh, retired man who was in a career of marketing and uh my name is Paul Ehrenberger from Rogers, Nebraska. Uh, children in Nebraska need LB 574, Take the Let Them Grow Act, to be passed. If I can interrupt you really quick, can you spell your first and last name for us for the transcription? Oh, yes. Thank Paul, P-A-U-L, Ehrenberger, E-H-E-R-N-B-E-R-G-E-R. -E -E Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, we really need this. The, the legislation is necessary to prevent children and teenagers from doing physical, emotional, spiritual, and psychological harm to themselves that they will regret for the rest of their lives. At our local city council meeting last night, I learned that Nebraska youth cannot legally buy or smoke cigarettes until age 21. Adults who sell cigarettes to minors are subject to criminal prosecution. Likewise, the lucrative industry that provides puberty blockers and hormones to children or performs surgery on sex organ organs of minors should not be able to fabricate a market that fills their coffers by deceiving Nebraska families. Legitimate gender dysphoria is not a new thing, but the fad for teenage girls to mutilate their bodies this way is a new thing. A century of extensive research revealed that only one out of 10,000 children suffered from gender dysphoria. That's like finding a needle in a haystack. If you tried to lift 10,000 pennies, you would feel the weight of 55 pounds. Compare that to the weight of just one penny. That's the ratio we're talking about here. True gender dysphoria is extremely rare. 100 years of scientific research has shown that when you do find a case of truly natural gender dysphoria, it's almost always a small boy. And that boy has a 70 to 90% chance of just naturally growing out of it. But we now face a craze for up to 30% of teenage girls reported in a single class to seek self-worth through gender transitioning. In the past decade, university hospitals offering these services to minors have sprung up all over the country, including Nebraska. Do no harm. The overall marketing of this social phenomenon appears to be a systematic and lucrative for many industries. I've seen books for small children in my hometown rural library that would groom little girls to become victims of this social phenomenon do no harm. Social media has fueled this craze for teenage girls. Paul? Yes. The red light kicked oh, on. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Nope. Well, you know my position. I, yeah, well, this is good. I, I appreciate it. Glad time. we could hear from you. you so we'll, we'll wait for a second just to make sure there's any questions from the committee. Seeing none, thank you very much for coming. I apologize in advance. I have to cut you off, right? I feel bad doing that. So. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you for this opportunity, and I want to thank, thank the senator for bringing this bill. My name is Kathy Wilmot, K-A-T-H-Y-W-I-L-M-O-T. I want to make it clear I'm speaking on my own behalf and also on the behalf of Nebraska Eagle Forum. 
uh, which is an organization that has worked for decades to protect our children and our constitutional rights and our families. And we definitely need this bill. I'm gonna walk away from my testimony because you've heard it all today. But I want to encourage you in the fact that our children are the future of this nation and we need that future. We're looking to each one of you to protect them. And it's critical, they can't change this. I faced a major medical issue myself and I know that the doctor was very careful to outline to me every option that I had, not just one. And then he let me know what the results of each one of those possibilities would be for me. And then I went home and <laughs> had to wrestle with what's the best decision I should make. And, and you just couldn't tell what that best decision was. And that was as an adult. And I'm going to tell you, that was difficult. And these children are not, or youth, are not able to make those decisions uh, and understand the implications. Uh, I don't understand parents that jump at these ideas without fully researching. Um, I feel bad for those children because they deserve every option that they can get, but we need to protect them until they're old enough to make those decisions. So I hope you'll support this bill. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Any questions from the committee? Just make sure. Say none, thank you. And we'll take the next proponent test fire. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Doug Kagan, D-O-U-G, K-A-G-A-N, Omaha, representing Nebraska Taxpayers for Freedom. Our group proposes state taxpayer funding for gender-altering procedures for individuals under the age of 19 for several reasons. These procedures are cosmetic or enhancement in nature, not compelling medical ones. It is not cost effective because the few receiving such treatment does not warrant taxpayer funding. These surgeries cost up to an expense of $50,000, not counting accompanying drugs and hormone treatments. We believe that allowing state funding will force taxpayers eventually to pay for similar procedures like elective cosmetic surgeries on other parts of their body, or even race alteration surgery. Furthermore, the Biden administration is allowing federal dollars to pay for sex change surgeries with accompanying chemicals that can permanently damage bodies. <clears throat> this administration endo endorses these procedures on minors without parental consent. LB 574 would serve as a bulwark against this arrangement. An increasing number of states prohibit direct or indirect use of pu public monies granted or paid to entities and personnel that provide gender-changing procedures. <clears throat> Bills in four states, including neighboring Missouri, exclude such sur surgeries as a tax-deductible health care expense. A host of reputable medical authorities here today already have categorically stated that these procedures can cause serious medical and psychological trauma, so I'm going to skip the rest of that paragraph. Um, in conclusion, we believe use of taxpayer, do taxpayer dollars unwarranted and urge you to advance LB 574 out of committee. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. We'll take the next proponent testify. Oh, we'll take one from the right side. You're right. Yeah. I've learned to go back and forth, otherwise everyone just starts looking at each other confused. So, All right, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much for your time, Senators. My name is Denise Bradshaw, D-E-N-I-S-E-B-R-A-D-S-H-A-W. I came down today to testify to a story very similar to Stephanie's. Growing up, I was a ferocious, what they would call then a tomboy. I really hated being a girl. It grossed me out so much. I couldn't, couldn't think of anything more mature than gross but it just grossed me out so much to be a girl. I am so grateful that I had a mom that didn't suffer from this variant Munchausen syndrome that seems to have overtaken so many parents. They stood by me. They didn't, even though they did not understand me, they stood by me and knew that the preteen and teen years was just a time of great change, a lot of emotion, 
and a lot of insecurity. But they never wavered in their love for me, and they let me just be and figure it out on myself. I was so lucky. I grew up to be the person I am today, a mom and a woman who went on, has worked for women's rights over the years many, many times. I am grateful for what I went through. It brought me here today to explain to you that not all dysphoria needs to be surgically fixed. It needs time to heal. And please give these children that time to heal. I was lucky enough to have parents who gave me that. Maybe others aren't that lucky, but surgery isn't the answer. Give the children time to heal and to grow. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Doug. Thank you for coming. You bet. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. We'll take the next proponent testifier from the side. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Michelle Bales, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-B-A-L-E-S. I'm here today to support LB 574. I am from Nebraska. My children are from Nebraska. Senator Kavanaugh, this is my story. I would like to add something few in the mainstream are acknowledging. Until very recently, the majority of individuals experiencing gender dysphoria had been sexually abused in some way. We must be willing to look at the root cause if we truly want to help our kids. This is relevant to my story. I am the mother of four daughters, three of whom have decided to join the LGBTQ community. It started when my third daughter was in sixth grade. She went to a friend's house for a sleepover where she was introduced to pornography, which is a form of sexual abuse. A year or so later, she got involved in a sexually charged relationship with a boy, which was kept secret from us. When the relationship ended, she spiraled into depression, even attempting suicide. Thankfully, the Lord spared her life. However, this was when she started thinking she was a boy. We talked with her about it many times, but she would always say one thing to us and do another. During this time, we discovered the medical community was not for us. Our daughter was seeing a therapist for her depression. Unbeknownst to us, that therapist was providing so-called gender affirmation. That's all she needed to confirm in her mind what she was believing. We did not find out about that affirmation for at least a year, but we did see the drastic changes she was making. She changed her wardrobe, started binding her breasts, and cut her hair. Then she had our now former family doctor tell her she didn't know what it was like to be born in the wrong body because she's not that kind of doctor. This from a doctor who delivers babies and declares their gender at birth. Now when the child is 16, she's unable to speak truth. Meanwhile, another suicide was attempted. This time, the hospital refused to call our daughter by her born gender and given name, despite our insistence on it. They were not interested in exploring why she was dysphoric, only in blaming us for her anxiety because we refused to call her a boy. These medical professionals encouraged my daughter to believe the lie. She chose to move out of our home during her senior year so she could continue pursuing this transgendered lifestyle. In October, she started taking testosterone. She is only 18 years old. She has not emancipated herself, neither have we relinquished our rights as her parents, and yet she is getting hormones from somewhere without parental consent. The damaging effects that have already happened to her body are heartbreaking to see. She once had a beautifully natural soprano voice and sang all the time. It's been replaced with an unnatural sounding lowness. She has facial hair and her acne has noticeably increased. More than that, the long-term effects can be infertility and osteoporosis, not to mention out of control mood swings and an increased risk of breast cancer. Even if at some point she stops taking the hormones, she will not experience a full recovery. Her voice will never return to what it was and she will have to shave the rest of her life. It is difficult to swallow the hard reality that the dreams we had of watching our daughter walk down the aisle to marry a young man and then have a family have likely been taken away. I believe this bill must be passed into law. But for the record, I also believe that any and all so-called gender affirmation treatment of a minor should be illegal. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Sarah Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story here today. Um, I just want to make sure is your child being prescribed testosterone without your permission? I believe she is going to Planned Parenthood. Um, because you can purchase testosterone over the counter. She well. is she is getting it from Planned Parenthood. Okay, so she is getting. I believe so. Are they, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't know. And there's they still need parental consent for prescriptions. Yes, parental consent. Mm -hmm. yes. and she is not 19. Right, that's what I I wanted mm -hmm. to find out if if we were 
talking about prescriptions that are happening without parental consent or if we're purchasing things over the counter because with testosterone that is something that is available. But thank you again for your testimony and for answering my questions. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. Okay, we'll take the next testifier in support. Yep. Pretty soon, as an FYI, we will be moving to a two minute testimony so we can get as many people in as we possibly can. Um, we'll do our best to make sure we kind of get everyone heard and not catch up as fast as I can, but uh, just to kind of put your thoughts in order so we can kind of condense things that we need to. Thank okay. you. Thank you. My name is Catherine Yeoman, spelled K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E, -E, and Yeoman spelled Y-O-H-M-A-N. And today I am speaking as a proponent of Bill LB-574. I would like you to all know that I'm the oldest of seven. I have five younger brothers. My youngest just turned five in January and my oldest turned December 15 in December. I am 22 years old, a member of Gen Z. I am what is considered elder Gen Z. And Gen Z has the highest transition rate the world has ever seen. Generation Alpha, which covers children born between 2010 to the mid 2020s, is predicted to have even higher rates of gender transition. I would like to point out that the attempted suicide rate is 41% in the USA. In Sweden, where medical transition is bankrolled by the government, the attempted rate remains the same, 41%. Why is that? Gender dysphoria is a symptom. It is often the sign of a larger problem like sexual trauma, depression, and BPD. I would like to tell you my story for a moment. I was, again, was the oldest of my siblings, and I watched my mother get beaten for two years from the ages of 13 to 15. Nothing made me more sad than thinking if I was a son, I could save my mother. I stepped between my mother and her abuser almost every time it happened, and I couldn't stop blaming myself for being born a woman. It wasn't until I reached my older teenage years, about age 17, that I realized I didn't need to be a man to defend the people I loved. I would also like to point out the true definition of compassion. Compassion does not mean enabling someone to hurt themselves. It does not mean enabling a person to be put into a statistic that is likely to try killing themselves. What it means is protecting their best interest and protecting them and making sure they don't try to hurt themselves later in life. Sorry, the lights, I don't know how much time I have. You still, you still got a little bit of time. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. I don't know why our modern culture has forgotten what the true definition of compassion is. Parental compassion embodies the idea of keeping your children's best interests in, at heart, understanding that what they might want now may not be what they want 10, 20, 50 years down the line. I want to uh, say that I am not up here today speaking from a place of hate. I am not up here speaking from a place of anger. I am up here speaking from a place of deep sadness because I want to ensure our children are safe. I will always fight good and hard, even if I fight alone. And that is a quote from Dr. Susan LaFleche uh, Pick, uh, Pickett. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. And I want to just highlight that we are not alone today. We may be the minor minority, but we are not alone. Thank you. Thank you for coming to testify. Of course. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you for coming. Thank you. We'll take our next testifier on this side of the room. And after you are done, we'll start two minute testimonies. So no problem. Way okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, being here, allowing me to testify. Uh, my name is Tracy Baker. That's T R A C E E B A K E R. First, let me just say that I have an 11 year old daughter that I feel is at high risk category for falling into the social contagion. But what I want to tell you is a story about my 20 year old self. Um, and then, and at that time, my six year old cousin. I was a sophomore in college and found myself pregnant with a boyfriend that wanted nothing to do with my pregnancy. I determined the best decision for myself and my unborn son was to have a family adopt him. I was blessed enough that my, that family ended up being my aunt and uncle and my six-year-old cousin, who is their biological child. My family did, and we still do, have Sunday dinners every week. So I was very close with my aunt, uncle, and cousin. My cousin at six understood I was pregnant and that one day the baby from my belly would come home with them and she would have a brother. 
On March 6, 1993, my son was born, and two days later, my aunt, uncle, and cousin took my son home. Almost immediately upon getting home with her new brother, my six-year-old cousin began asking, who are my real parents? For the next several months, my cousin continued with this question, even though my aunt and uncle showed pictures of her in my aunt's belly, pictures of them at the hospital after she was born. She was hysterical, could not sleep, and insisted she had other parents like her brother. Finally, after therapy and some time, she was able to understand that her parents were her biological parents. I tell you this story because children, like my cousin at the time, do not have the ability to comprehend such adult concepts such as adoption, and they should not have to try to understand anything like gender identity. We need to stop forcing these subjects on our children at school, and we need to let them be children. We need to quit pushing our adult ideologies and thoughts on them. We need to quit putting them on puberty blockers that are harmful to their young bodies. We need to quit butchering them before they can fully grasp the finality of their decisions. Please, for the grace of God, and to protect our innocent, young-minded children, pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. We'll take the next testifier on this side of the room. Welcome. Greetings. My name is Thomas Morgan, the second T-H-O-M-A-S-M-O-R-G-A-N, Roman numeral two. I'm here because there's obviously a war for the minds going on that many people are either aware of or they're not aware of. And right now we're talking about children and how fragile they are. Many people have been here to actually share their testimony that have been on both sides of this. So I won't have to go into that too much because it's very apparent. Right? Right. War for the minds. Your SARS, Corona, and COVID. I have traveled this country over 100,000 miles since March 15th of 2020 without a mask on. Yet I am still here. That's as adults, whether you wore a mask or not, that's a war for your minds that has been going on. So if our children are dealing with this and you have been charged with taking care of them and the institutions that can either do the right thing or not do the right thing, do the right thing. And by not do the right thing or do the right thing, it's very simple. You take care of the children. You don't allow companies that are here for money to put this garbage on our children. As a veteran fighting wars, while they're saying that this is going down, I heard mid-2000s, they have your, all your alpha males overseas fighting. There's a reason that that happened, and we're suffering the consequences of that right now. If you're in the middle of this war that's going on, then it's up to you to do the right thing, and the right thing is to take care of the children. It's that simple. It's that simple. Anything else after this is nonsense. You take care of the children. That's our future. Thank you. Thank you for coming to testify. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you for coming. Take the next testifier from this side of the room, please. Greetings. My name is Dana Schleiss, spelled D-E-N-N-I-S-S-C-H-L-E-I-S. -S -S. Nebraska must join the increasing number of states that already have passed or are in the process of passing the legislation barring taxpayer funding for gender-altering procedure, also known as GAPS. Uh, in 2021, Kansas, excuse me, Arkansas passed a law banning gaps for minors. Uh, in Texas bill, HB 1029 reads, no funds authorized or appropriated by state law shall be expended for any gender assignment. Uh, then we go to the state of Ohio. Uh, in, in year 2022, HB 454 prohibits the distribution of public monies to organizations or individuals that offer gender transition procedures to minors. And then we go to uh, another example, the state of Mississippi, Senate Bill 2728 
public funds are forbidden for direct or indirect use of an organization or individual that provides gender transition services to anyone under 18. I believe Nebraska must pass LB 574. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. We'll take the next testifier from this side of the room, please. Welcome. Hi there. My name is Elizabeth Davids, E L I Z A B E T H D A V I D S. I would encourage you to go watch the two and a half hour Jordan Peterson extensive interview with Chloe Cole, uh, much of which Luca has already described, but I thought I would add some details. Uh, Chloe convinced herself that removing her breasts would be the answer to her struggles, and doctors were only happy to receive payment for removing her breast tissues, cutting off her nipples scraping adjacent skin and replacing the nipples in a more masculine location for her chest and reorienting her nerves into other areas in her torso. It was only a month after the surgery that she began deeply regretting her surgery and realizing the full weight of what she as a young teenager had been allowed to do to her body that she can never undo. She says of that time, I felt like a monster. In some cases like Chloe's, reconstructive surgeries can make the situation even worse. No one told her what the possible side effects were. As an 18 year old now, Chloe has to wrap her chest every day because of the constant leaking from her chest. She experiences joint pain and urinary tract issues that are common side effects from the cross sex hormones and experiences sexual dysfunction as an 18 year old that is typical for women in their fifties. She breaks down and cries on camera weeping. How was I supposed to know? And from a male's perspective, uh, this is Tulip R on Instagram. No one told me that the base area of your penis is left. It cannot be removed, meaning you're left with a literal stump inside that twitches. When you take testosterone and your libido returns, you wake up with morning wood without the tree. Because even if I had a sex drive, my neo-vagina is so narrow and small, I wouldn't even be able to have sex if I wanted to. And when I do use a small dilator, I have random pockets of sensation that only seem to pick up pain rather than pleasure. Any pleasure I do get comes from the prostate, which was moved forward and wrapped in glands from the penis, meaning anal sex isn't possible and can risk further damage. Then there's the act of going to the toilet. It takes me about 10 minutes to empty my bladder. It's extremely slow, painful, and because it dribbles, no matter how much I relax, it will then just go all over that entire area, leaving me soaking. How is it that at age 35, I run the risk of smelling like piss everywhere I go? With that, we'll have to end your testimony because the red light's on. <laughs> hey, we'll see if one more quick, just to make sure there's no questions from the committee. Seeing none, okay, we'll take the next testifier. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Pastor Angie Klein from Bellevue, Nebraska, A-N-G-I-E-K-L-E-I-N. I'm gonna be honest with you in this room today. There was a time in my 20s that I wanted to rearrange my skin because I had a desire to be a man rather than a woman. I was already living with my lesbian partner for over six years and thought that my life would be better if I would just transition to what my heart felt like. I thought mistakes were made when God designed me. And as a woman that I would make I would take matters into my own hands and rearrange my skin to match my inner desire to be a man. Mind you, that was in my 20s. 22 years ago, I left my lesbian partner and the LGBTQ community for good. I am glad that I never rearranged my skin on my body to match an inner desire that was fleeting since childhood. At the age of 40, my husband and I had our first child and I was overwhelmed by the thought that my decision in my 20s not to transition gave me the opportunity to bear children and was able to breastfeed both of my children. The way my body was designed allowed me to live in the fulfillment of how I was created as a woman. I have trans friends who have transitioned back to how they were created. One lives with the consequences of puberty blockers. She will never bear children, all because she chased a desire deep inside her that told her that she was something else. My other friend lives with his consequences as well. Both of them struggle with what the puberty blockers did to them physically, mentally, and chemically, 
And yet some in this room think that puberty blockers are a safe thing to give children. Many say these drugs are completely irreversible and that there is no on and off switch for puberty. Nothing could be further from the truth. I thank you. I support LB 574. Thank you for your testimony. Yes. Uh, any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you. Yep. We'll take our next testifier in support on this side of the room. A-M-B-E-R-P-A-R-K-E-R. -E -E Members of the committee, in front of you, you will have a Nebraska medicine form. It is ages 13 to 18 years of age. It is what we would call the one of the starts of the process to transition. I had just spoke with Luca, and um, she had shared with me that Dr. Jean Amora and Megan Smith-Sollins were both in the care of what she had went through, and now she is in the in the detransitioned. I want to let you know that WPATH, which stands for the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, has two members at the Nebraska Medicine. It's underneath the Gender Care Clinic Providers. Dr. Jean A-M-O-U-R-A is a specialist in transgender care and hormone therapy who serves both adolescents and adults. I want you guys to look down at the end of your paper where there is an address, and I want to tell you these words are missing. Transgender clinic. On the last page of what I had handed to you, it says, do you have a desire to have surgery in the future, yes or no? If yes, what kind of surgery are you interested in? Chest reconstruction, hysterectomy, uperectomy, medioplasty, phalloplasty, breast augmentation, or removal of testes, vaginal plasty, tracheal shave, facial feminization surgery. I want to let you know that Megan Smith is married to the trans activist, the Ryan Sollins. And Ryan Sollins has been invited to the Lincoln Public School System. Uh, excuse me, people were unaware. There was um, talks, I believe, on the uh, puberty blocker side, as well as the word psychosexual needs being met. Uh, for children in the context. These questions need to be asked. I myself have been targeted by the LGBTQ militia. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you. Thank you. We'll take our next test for our support on this side of the room, please. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. My name is Tiffany Carter, T-I-F-F-A-N-Y-C-A-R-T-E-R. -E I have a big packet of stuff for you. Um, I know two minutes isn't a lot of time, so I'm not going to go over all of it, but I just want to talk about the illusor illusory truth effect. Basically, what that means is the more you hear something, the more it becomes truth. So that second package, I have um, some pictures for you. Um, I have listed here uh, for you uh, 76 books that are available in the Nebraska um, public libraries. Um, I can't verify every single one in the school libraries, but I know that a lot of them are there. I've been doing research for over a year on, on school book content. So when you think about this illusory truth effect, the more that you hear something, the more it becomes true. When you have board books and children's books that are pushing these ideologies, um, some of these books are, are um, suggested to be zero to, zero to three years old, then it's no wonder that we have this thing going on that we call a contagion with all this stuff because we're pushing this as a young age. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, there is that article um, for teens, uh, trans and teens, the social contagion factor is real. Basically, um, what we've already heard today about different countries that they're seeing that this is happening. Um, and then I have a couple of studies um, from the American College of Pediatricians. The main thing I want to say here, um, the American College of Pediatricians recommends an immediate cessation of these interventions, talking about PRV blockers and um, the surgeries, as well as an end to promoting gender ideology via school curricula and legislative policies. Healthcare school curricula and legislation must remain anchored to physical reality. And I'll leave you with that. I really hope that you take a chance and actually read these things because um, the science shows what we've already heard today. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. We'll take the next testifier in support from this side of the room, please. 